Wow, 46.8, the highest score we have seen all day. Snowboarder Sean White grabbing gold in the men's half pipe, shredding the competition and flying high into the history books. It's his record third medal in the event and coincidentally, the 100th overall Winter Olympic gold for Team USA. Here you are on the verge of your fifth Olympics. Is it still as special as it was when you were making your debut in Torino? You know, I can't say it's as special. It's just got its own qualities to it, you know? Nothing compares to the first time, but, um, you know, I haven't really said this too much, so it's going to feel weird coming out of my mouth, but this, this is, uh, I think, my last run. So it's got a whole different special meaning, I think, this one. I'm really enjoying every little piece of it. I mean, the ups and downs, the traveling, the camaraderie with uh, my team and, um, you know, the other athletes, and there's just this kind of glow to it, you know, so I'm really savoring every moment. No matter what, this is it. I think so, yeah, yeah. Why? You know, it's, so it's hard to talk about, you know, because my, my whole life, I've kind of, you know, been looked at as somewhat, you know, <laughs> superhuman because I do these, these things and a lot of people have always come up to me and just like, I don't know how he does it. And I, you know, and I prided myself on being that, you know, individual and man, realizing and, and admitting to myself and everyone else, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm human. It's, it's taking a toll, there's wear and tear. I mean, like, you know, I, I've, <laughs> I finally realized what the older competitors were talking about. And they're like, wait till you're 30, wait till you're 30. I'm 35 now. And I'm like, I wake up and I'm like, going to my coach, I'm like, God, my ankle, you know, my ankle hurts. He's like, what happened? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I woke up, <laughs> just like, oh, you know, or my back, I was doing something so silly, like in the gym, I, no weights, nothing. I was just jumping up on this box. I, I just landed and my back just kind of went like, <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And, and I'm thinking like, ah, give it a couple hours. I'll be good. You know, three days later, it's like, oh, maybe a week, like two weeks. I'm sitting there like, oh my goodness. Like, you know, just that recovery time and that ability to bounce back is just, you know, unfortunately it's just not what it was. And um, I don't know, I've always kind of assumed that I would get a sign, you know, whether it was my body or whether it was, you know, my motivation wasn't there or, uh, or the tricks just got so heavy, I wasn't ready. I couldn't han handle it anymore. I couldn't deal. Um, but I think it's, it's, I think it's now like a little mix of it all, you know. I, I don't know. I think the motivation's definitely still there. But the body, you know, the, the, the decline in the abilities with the, the sport still rising, it's just an inevitable sort of situation to be in. And um, being honest with myself and just putting it out there, you know, I, I, I want to be... I mean, I'm a competitor. I'm gonna give it everything I have. I, I, I know what I wanna do. I wanna end it in a certain way. You know, obviously having three gold medals is just incredible for me and my career and, and the legacy I wanna leave behind. And I feel like this last Olympics especially was just the icing on the cake. I mean, that one was even a stretch. I was feeling the wear and tear and, you know, came down to that last run. I'm the last guy to go. I had to do a run I had never done before in competition in order to win it, and I just nailed it. Are we gonna see the back-to-back -back 1440s? Yes, we are. Back-to-back -back 1440s there for Sean White. The skyhook, the front side 540. Now into the double make twist, the tomahawk, and he gets that around. Sean White now with a front side double court 1260, and he puts it down, and Sean White with an incredible run there. Looking back, I mean, I'm so proud of that moment. And so now I feel like I'm in this kind of bonus situation. And um, so yeah, I'm taking it day by day. Um, but um, this, this, will be, this will be it. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of excited about it, though. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me.
Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. I've been kind of describing it to friends of mine because, and I laugh when I think about it because I got this huge event coming my way, you know, fifth Olympics, so much pressure I'm putting on myself, what I want to do, you know, to have a great appearance, a great showing. Um, but then some part of me kind of like laughs and smiles. It's like when you know that high school is ending and you don't, you're like, well, I actually don't. I don't ever have to go to school again if right. I don't want to. Yeah. Obviously, you know, there's college and whatnot, but say you're graduating college, you're like, wow, well, like, no more homework, no more, you know, showing up to class on time. You know, like, for me, it's it's a wild concept. This has been such a, a long and amazing journey in my life, but to, to be reaching this point of like, wow, I won't have to, like, worry if today's the day I'm going to get, like, a terrible crash or, like, be stressed that I'm going to, not put down the run when it has to happen or you know and i i think it's it's a really bizarre but exciting you know feeling and um something i'm looking forward to and then i get to come up and uh watch everybody else stress out <laughs> you, know? <laughs> like, you know so it sounds it sounds good um you know but i i just don't know what it'll be like until i you know i, I can see the doors cracked open but i haven't fully walked through it yet obviously so and you've been the face of of snowboarding for almost 20 years yeah, yeah. and you're gonna walk away from it mm -hmm. and you're okay with it you've made peace with it yeah i i'm 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 so good with it you know you seem Which like is, you are how, yeah. did you, how did you get here i'll tell you so i i think there was a couple things in this this path to feeling the way i am now but one of them for sure was like talking to tony hawk He's always been, you know, an amazing guy and, you know, somebody that's been through it all. I remember talking to him and he was like, man, I, he's like, I retired at, at 32. And he's like, I wish I would have done it sooner. He's like, look at, look at my career. He's like, I, I've done more now than my entire competitive career. He's like, I'm still Tony Hogg. I still do the stuff. I, I skate every day. I have fun. I'm just not worried about like getting points and getting scores and titles and things. It's like, a different way to look at it. And I think that's what's so amazing about our sports is that there is, you know, a sort of life beyond competing. You know, there's filming video parts. There's all sorts of different things that you can do and be so productive in the sport when you're not competing. So that was like really cool to talk to him and kind of get a glimpse of what that life's like. And to hear him say he would have done it even sooner was yeah. kind of a trip to me because I thought 32 was yeah. it pretty young, you know, and so. 35 is pretty young. Yeah, and so that's what's, that's what's awesome too, is I feel, you know, maybe not as, as, you know, I don't think it bounced back as fast as when I was 19, obviously, but I feel great. And I think, you know, um, you know, gosh, to, to feel solid about my physical <laughs> well-being and still I mean, continue on. I know, I, you know, it's, um, but I really didn't think I'd feel this way. Yeah, I was going to say, you, I know, mean, you I really like, seem to be at peace with all of it. I, yeah, yeah. Good for you. Yeah, thank you. Not nervous, not worried. There's some concerns, you know, obviously like, you know, I've been at certain events before. I have a, I have a event series that I put on. It's called Aaron Style. And I remember handing out an award to the, when I don't compete at my own event. And I remember handing this award to this <laughs> young snowboarder and like 
this deep rooted part of me is like, I want this. True. <laughs> I didn't want to give it to him. Um, so I know there's some sort of, you know, competitive void that will need to be filled. Yeah. Um, but but I'm excited about it. I think I think it's time, and I'm I'm definitely, you know, I've kind of made peace with it all. And so now that's why everything's super fun and enjoyable, and I'm kind of like, you know, making the rounds with all the writers and, yeah. um, you know, uh, yeah. You have a farewell tour. Yeah, totally. So I'm just excited to see what he's got here on the money. One, one two, and three. Oh, he threw it out here. He is not holding back. This triple cork, once, once deemed too dangerous, for competition, and now it seems like to win in, in Beijing, you may have to pull it off. Yeah, um, so the triple cork, I mean, started, <laughs> it's kind of my fault, I think. <laughs> I tried it back in 2013. It didn't end well. Does he realize he's in trouble? You see the helmet explode off his head. It was strapped on tightly. That is a block of ice that basically he took to the face. I think I, I came through the flip and I just, uh, I felt like I was too far inside the wall, like I just didn't pull off enough. And I'm thinking these thoughts, you know, after two flips, so I kind of open up and I clip the top and fall to the bottom. And, um, you know, it was a pretty epic crash. I bounced back, you know, it took me a minute, but I, I you know, got back to it. And then the sport kind of took this other turn. We'd only done double flip 1080s at this point. Yeah. And another rider had invented the double flip uh, 1440. So the, the numbers I'm throwing out are just degrees of rotation. Okay. So 180 is half of a circle, 360 full circle, 540, 720, uh, 900, 1080. So just while doing a double flip. So it's a, it's a lot of twisting and flipping, but he managed to pull it off. And I remember seeing it online and I, I, I don't know how I figured, I just like studied it all night and then did it the next day. <laughs> I went up and just like pulled up his video and then um, landed it. And that was before Sochi. Um, and, you know, that's kind of how far in advance that trick was, the yeah. triple cork. And so now it's kind of come back full swing. And there's, I think, three or four, you know, Japanese snowboarders that have attempted it and landed it. And so it's, it's definitely become something that, you know, we'll have to have going to Beijing. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. I believe, I believe. Every dream, journey, and triumph. And it all starts here. United States, let's go! Feel the magic every day. The excitement is in the air. At the Winter Olympics, today is where the games begin. I believe, I believe. Every dream, every journey, every triumph. And it all starts here. Let the celebration begin! The excitement is in the air. The United States, let's go! Isn't he superhuman? the magic every day. She is a superstar. Oh, Kayla, we are cheering you yeah. on. And share every moment with us at the Winter Olympics. Today, today, today. today. today is where the games begin. I believe, I believe. Every dream, journey, and triumph. And it all starts here. United States, let's go! Feel the magic every day. The excitement is in the air. At the Winter Olympics, today is where the games begin. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. How, how has the training changed mm. um, since your debut almost 20 years ago? How do you train yeah. differently? 
Um, or do you? No, it's 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 totally different. I mean, I used to just go. I mean, I it, whether it was <laughs> you know windy or whatever. I mean, I would just kind of like you know figure out where I needed to be at what point in the year, and I would just you know get there, little steps every day to get to that point. Um, you know, and I think as time went on, I realized that I needed more. Um, I think just like companionship. I needed people around. Cause it would just be like me out in the wilderness, a couple cameramen and and you know, my coach, and we would just get to it. Not even a coach actually at that point. It was just like, okay, where's half I like I know what to do. And um and and you know, most of the cameramen were like, they're all my friends, the ex-snowboarders or whatever. And so you had people around you, um, which was fun, but no other riders. It was just me and the half pipe. And as time went on, I think Sochi was that benchmark where I realized that like I'd been drawing from the same pool of motivation yeah. and that had just kind of run dry. Um, and, and I couldn't get to that place I needed to anymore without you know, changing a lot of things in my life. Um, you know, which, which was really, you know, it was a difficult time. I mean, social media had just exploded and like, you know, there's a difference between like hearing about a friend's birthday you missed or a family outing or something. And it's a difference, you know, big difference between seeing it on this like this giant revolving, you know, um, window of everybody's lives and oh, it was Cinco de Mayo. Oh, it was so, uh, oh, they're, oh, they're all in Cancun. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I'm missing everything. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. And, and at a time where I really wanted to, you know, be in those places and enjoy those things with my friends and uh, family and people. Um, so that was just like a tough time. So there, there was like a longing to, you know, do something different after that many years of competing and doing the kind of same thing. And I remember being at the Olympics in Russia and I'm standing there at the half pipe. I'm the last person to go. There's one more run. And for some reason in my gut, I was just like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose, I'm gonna blow this. I don't know why, I, I just, I was sitting there, I could feel it. <laughs> yeah, Sean. Yeah, baby. One run for it all. Sean starting his run off huge. He wants it. Will this be the 1440? Slight mistake. Yuri Podlachikov looking on in anticipation. Wow, this is going to be a difficult one to score. Yeah, it was like watching this movie that you couldn't really change the outcome until it was over and the fog was lifted. And I'm like, wow, what, what, did this really just happen? Like, what's my life like now? All these things. And, um, and so the journey to that next Olympics wasn't so much of a physical one, but like a, a mentally, mental and emotional one. You know, I had to kind of like, go, okay, like I'd never been to an Olympics and lost before. These constant reminders of it everywhere. And, um, but there was this amazing silver lining to it all where, you know, people were like, oh, you're, you're the champ. I'm like, what? Oh, we're still counting the, the times before? I thought it was all erased. So it was this kind of wonderful place to find myself. And from there, I took these, you know, amazing steps to just kind of like generally be happy, you know. It was, it was tough, honestly, because I didn't really know where to start. And none of it had to do with snowboarding. I was like, okay, well, like, uh, you know, my brother and I worked together for years designing products, doing all these things. You know, he had gone through kind of a, tough time in his personal life and I was in my 20s going crazy and we just kind of parted ways and we had never really addressed the issues you know we were still you know cool with one another but we, we never really talked about it so it's like oh we should go talk and gosh I should go to that Cinco de Mayo event oh and I should go to this and like so I started doing all the things that you know I felt like I'd missed out on or I wanted to do and took a little time away um and then I started piecing these things together. Like, okay, well, if I was gonna go to the Olympics again, I feel like, you know, the previous coach and I had, uh, we had a great relationship, but it just something didn't meet up at that last Olympics. So I found a new coach, this guy, JJ Thomas, amazing guy, um, super uh, high energy, 
motivated, super fun to be around, you know, just great. Not that the other one wasn't, I just needed something new. It was like a new businessman, a new publicist, like where am I living? Am I happy with my home? You know, you travel so much, you check in, you're like, gosh, is the pool even working? Like, is this I'm working so hard for all these things that I don't enjoy them? Um, so anyways, that was like these little steps of like, well, what can I change in my life to just be overall happier? And I remember working out was a big one. And I laugh about that because <laughs> when I tell people that I started working out in 2014, <laughs> they're like, Really? I thought you, well, I didn't need to before. I didn't really, yeah. you know, I'd been winning. So I was like, well. So you weren't working out? No, like, I mean, I was claiming it pretty, if you go look at the old interviews, I right. was, right. <laughs> I was claiming it pretty hard, but uh, it's no. All it's all a lot. <laughs> no, I mean, I would, right. I would occasionally like hit the bike or do, yeah. do some things, but I mean, I was, I was competing an entire winter season as a professional snowboarder and then kicking into gear as a professional skateboarder all summer. So I, I didn't really need it. I was so physically fit. Um, but when I actually applied myself and started working out, it was, yeah, toward the end of like 2014. And um, I just remember thinking like, every time I leave the gym, I feel better about myself, about my day, like I accomplished something. And I was like, I just wanna feel that way. And then obviously you get the benefits of working out consistently. Um, but those were just these like steps that I was taking toward this overall kind of, you know, feeling better about just my life in general. And then once I got back on the snowboard, I was just like a happier guy. And I was like, oh, I'm just getting back to what I know. And then it just took off from there. But that was all, it was all fine and, and dandy until I got to New Zealand and had this like horrific crash. So, you know, that, that whole journey I was on was like really put to the test. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world, because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at eight on NBC News Now. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? I believe, I believe. Every dream, journey, and triumph. And it all starts here. United States! Feel the magic every day. The excitement is in the air. At the Winter Olympics, today is where the games begin. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. And to the favorite, the 19-year-old Sean White from Carlsbad, California. Are you as fearless when you're out there at 35 as you were at 19? I think that I'd have to say no, just because I've I'm older and I think now <laughs> I can actually process the like, oh, I've been through this bad accident. So if this goes wrong, I do know the outcome, <laughs> you know, and you start to like, you know, you take in things into account. Like, oh, I didn't sleep as much last night. Should I really be doing this? Or, uh, you know, am I still jet lag? Am I this, you know, and you, you get good reasons to procrastinate. So it's definitely tough, but I will say I still have that ability to pull the trigger when I need okay today's the day let's go i mean if you go check out my uh some posts i just put on my instagram from switzerland i just i was there that day here's it's, the time is now i got to do this trick and i just flew in the air clipped the top flew to the bottom hit my back you know the crashes this it's a kind of necessary evil of you know progressing you're gonna take falls you're gonna mess up you have to adjust and be ready and so I will say I have the abilities to, to, to still like go for it when I need to, but I think I just needed more rest days after the crash. 
Yeah. More ice. Not to the crash, but just as, <laughs> as you get older, just needing more rest in general. Yeah, of course. Um, in Tokyo, as you know, Simone Biles uh, started a very um, powerful conversation about uh, mental health and athletes yeah. and the games themselves. Mm -hmm. um, as that was unfolding and you were watching and listening, what do you think? You know, that was wild. I was actually lucky enough to be in Tokyo at the time um, doing some, you know, behind the scenes TV stuff. And um, yeah, I was, I was taken back by what she did just because it's such a rarity that we kind of like come out and say how we're feeling, you know, there's, there's such a rarity to it. And I think her opening up really kind of paves the way for other people to explain how they're feeling, whether or not they need to pull out of the event or not, you know, is up to them, but just to be like, hey, I'm really feeling this pressure, you know, it's, it's always seen as like weakness as an athlete, you're supposed to be just like, you're strong, you're never wavering, you're, you know, the, the clutch performer when it's all on the line, you know, you have to be that way. And like I kind of admitted when we first started talking, you know, I'm, I'm human, it's, and it's hard to admit that sometimes. So I was, I was, I was, you know, proud of her for taking that stand. And especially the fact that you can go out there and potentially get hurt. Um, I was in a very similar situation um, at the Russia Olympics. I had made the team for the slope style event, which is a series of jumps, unlike the half pipe. Um, I'd earned my spot. I'd, I'd taken crazy, you know, crashes and all these things to get to that place, earn that spot. And I got to the Olympics and remember standing there going, this course is just like terrifying. I'm watching people crash left and right, getting knocked out. Don't even remember flying there, like all these things and I just went this this isn't worth it and I, I pulled out of that event and I got a lot of backlash from you know fellow you know competitors and people and um, you know just the online chatter about w w my decision you know and, um, and it was tough you have to be very strong-willed to deal with that and I was just so excited to see that people embraced her rather than kind of like you know, pushing her aside yeah. as somebody that was undeserving of being there or, or, you know, had failed us in somehow, which is complete, completely wrong. It was incredible. So what is Sean White's expectation for Beijing? I've kind of just told myself that I'm going to give it everything and I'm just going to let it happen as it will. I don't know. I'm just going to let the, the, you know, kind of chips fall. I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I'd love to sit here and be like, I'm going to win it, and this is going to, and I'm going to be standing there, and maybe, maybe not. You know, I've kind of prepared myself for each outcome, and that's, I think, kind of why I'm so happy about everything, is I've, I've prepared myself where I'm like, gosh, if I could win again, I mean, oh my goodness, like, what an amazing accomplishment, even to podium. It sounds like you've changed your expectations over the years. Yes and no. I mean, obviously, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm competitive, so I'm going to give it everything I have. But I guess I've been on both sides of the coin. You know, I've been to the Olympics and won. It was incredible. Obviously, it changed my life. And I've been in loss before, you know, fell short of the podium. And, and life went on and it was amazing. And, you know, and so now kind of going in, well, and then I went back and I won again. <laughs> so I've, I've kind of realized this sort of, you know, blissfulness of it all is like I can I can go there and I can, you know, have an amazing time and either succeed in, in my endeavors and, and get that gold again and get what I'm, I'm, trust me, I want it. You know, I wouldn't be here if that wasn't the case, but being able to like stand proud and pass the torch to the next generation would be amazing as well. So I'm kind of ready for it all. It'll go out soon. Don't mind the dust.
I love throwing a party, but let's face it, if the food isn't good, the party sucks. My niece Madeline is turning too soon and I've created the perfect menu for feeding a big crowd with even bigger appetites. Madeline may be small, but just like the rest of us, she knows how to pack it in. First up, I'm making a version of my penne alla vodka that could be baked ahead of time. Then I'll be whipping up an Italian American classic that really goes a long way when feeding a crowd, sausage and peppers. Finally, for dessert, chocolate cupcakes with luscious chocolate hazelnut buttercream. So let's get this party started. When it comes to my family, we love making dishes that keep on giving. You know, like being able to go for seconds, even thirds sometimes. And this dish is one of them. Growing up, my mom would always make baked ziti and it was like a special night for us. Me and my brother absolutely loved baked ziti night. This version is very similar, but uses vodka sauce instead of just a plain old tomato sauce. The first thing I'm going to do is warm a couple of tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil into a really large high-sided skillet. I'm gonna put that over a medium-high heat. To that, I'm adding four ounces of diced pancetta, and we wanna cook that just until it's nice and crispy. You really want a small dice here so that when we mix this into our casserole dish later on, there's a little bit of pancetta in every bite. This is where it starts to pop like popcorn. And then to this, I'm going to just grate in one large clove of garlic. I don't need a ton of garlic because my tomato sauce has plenty in there. Hmm, smells so good already. Just give that a quick stir to kind of let that garlic melt right on in. Now we start having some fun. We need some vodka for vodka sauce. I'm using a half cup of a really good vodka. If you're doing this over a gas stove, be very careful. Because fire. Madeline would absolutely love this. Okay, so you just wanna reduce the vodka by about half, scraping up any of the brown bits on the bottom of the pan. And to this, I'm gonna add three quarter cup of heavy cream and two cups of my everyday tomato sauce, which you can learn how to make by watching the risotto episode of season one. And just stir it to combine. It's gonna be this gorgeous light pink color. Trying to match my shirt. Isn't that a beautiful color? And now I'm going just to reduce this slightly. In the meantime, Let's throw in our pasta. So generously salt, some boiling water, make sure it comes back to a boil. Then I'm gonna add a pound of penne de gate. Because this is a baked pasta, it's going to continue cooking in the oven. I'm only cooking the pasta about three quarters of the way at this point, so like super molto al dente. Remember when we made a big fire in here? I have a one pound brick of whole milk mozzarella and I'm just gonna grate that. And if some larger chunks fall in, that's totally cool. Those will just be bigger melty chunks of cheese in your finished baked penne alla vodka. Okay. This sauce is looking really good. It smells really good too. So my pasta is about three quarters of the way cooked and I'm just gonna use a spider to transfer it right into my vodka sauce. And at this point, I'm also gonna add about a half cup of the cooking liquid. I'm gonna cut the heat. Now I know it looks really liquidy, don't worry about that. As the pasta cooks in the oven, it's going to continue to absorb some of it and it'll be perfect in the end, I promise. Now we just have a few more ingredients to add. Quarter cup of grated pecorino, a 15 ounce container of whole milk ricotta cheese, Give it a taste for seasoning. Could use a little salt and about a quarter of a teaspoon of black pepper. And then I'm going to add two thirds of this grated mozzarella right into the pot. And just stir it as quickly as possible because it's going to start to melt. 
make sure everything's really well combined. I see a big clump of mozzarella. Okay, you can see it's already getting a little stringy. Grab a nine by 13 casserole dish and right on in. I wanna get all of that deliciousness. I'm gonna just spread it into an even layer. Look how cheesy this already is, but I'm not done. I have that remaining mozzarella cheese that I'm just gonna sprinkle over the top. Yes, all the cheese. Grab a sheet of aluminum foil and wrap it around the top. Wrap it tightly. We wanna trap in the steam, which is gonna help the pasta cook and stay moist. I'm gonna cook this in a 350 degree oven for 45 minutes covered. Then I'll remove the foil, give it another 15 minutes to start to crisp it, and then hit it for a minute or two under the broiler so that the cheese gets nice and golden brown and crispy. Look at this melty cheese goodness. Now, I need to make sure this is up to Madeline standard, so of course I have to taste it. Hmm, this has the perfect combo of cheesiness and crispy bits. Mm. Oh my God, that is so good. It is so cheesy. The vodka sauce is just so delicious. My niece is going to absolutely love this. That's why I'm her favorite uncle. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. You got the nerd. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon. And by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts. Sausage and peppers are the perfect party dish. This recipe is truly no frills using just a few ingredients that are just flavorful and delicious. So I'm using two green bell peppers, two red bell peppers, and one large white onion, just because it reminds me of the Italian flag. You can use any color combination that you'd like. So just trim off the tops and then pull out the centerpiece. And then I have them and kind of go in with my knife and just cut away the membrane. Depending on how big they are, you can quarter these onto the red. Once that's all taken care of, you wanna slice these into quarter inch strips. Then for the onion, just remove the top. I'm gonna cut it in half and then cut it into quarter inch half moons. And that can go right on in the same bowl. And while I'm here, I'm just gonna prepare my garlic. I have four large cloves that I'm just going to thinly slice. That was a big one. Just push that to the side. And that's the bulk of the prep. Now I have 
a sausage ring. I love using a sausage ring. Growing up, my dad would always grill sausage ring in the summers, and I just love it, really. We're going to be searing this, so I'm just gonna pat it and make sure that there's no excess moisture so we get a really nice sear. And then I'm just gonna take a fork and prick around to break the casing so that it doesn't explode when cooking. And I'll do that on both sides. Now that the sausage is prepared, time to start cooking. I'm going to add about two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil to a large high-sided skillet. We're gonna get this nice and hot. Add your sausage. Press it down to make sure it's making contact with the pan. And I'm using a splatter screen. It really does help cut back on the amount of grease that comes flying off as your sausage sears. So if you have it, this is a really good time to use it. I'm gonna cook it on both sides until it's nice and seared, about six to eight minutes per side. The sausage is really the star of the show for this dish. So be sure to find really premium sausage. I like to get mine at my local Salumeria. It's been about six, almost seven minutes. So be careful. It does have a tendency to kind of splatter on you as you're trying to flip it. Just work it back down and then cover it back up in another six to eight minutes. I'm not looking to fully cook this sausage at this point. It's going to go into the oven. I just really want that nice sear on it. So carefully, Remove it, put it back on the sheet pan. Don't worry that it was on the raw sheet pan. It's going back and we're cooking it. Now, I'm going to add about a quarter cup more of extra virgin olive oil and our onion and peppers. And at this point, you wanna to start to season your vegetables. So a couple of generous pinches of salt as the vegetables cook, they'll release their liquid, which you can then use to deglaze the bottom of your pan and get all of these gorgeous brown bits up. That's all flavor from the sausage. Should I try to get a toss? Let's see if it works. While the vegetables continue to cook, I'm actually going to, at this point, remove the skewers that are holding the sausage ring together. There's usually at least four. Now I'm just gonna take my knife and cut these into about three, four inch pieces. So my vegetables are pretty tender at this point. I'm going to add the sliced garlic. And then the sausage goes right into the pan, kind of nestle it into the vegetables. Then I like to take any of the juices that may have come out of the sausage and just add that to the pan as well. It's all flavor. And at this point, all we need to do is put it in a 400 degree oven until the sausage is cooked through, the vegetables get super tender. It's gonna take about 20 minutes. how crispy that sausage is. The vegetables are super tender and have almost melted into this gorgeous sauce on the bottom of the pan. I think I need to give it a taste. It's so good as is, but in my family, we love to serve it on some sort of a roll. Now, I'm gonna teach you a secret. Don't tell anyone I told you this, but you wanna take your roll and kinda just gently press it in to absorb just some of that juice. It's the best part. And then just build your sandwich. Make sure you get a little bit of everything on there so that every bite has some of the vegetables and then some of that crispy sausage. It's a little bit messy, but some of the most messy food items are the best ones. Looks so good. 
The vegetables are super tender. The sauce is just plain old delicious and nice and crispy. This is definitely going to be a hit at the party. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Prince. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. In the city of angels, two kindly old ladies wanted to help homeless men get off the streets forever. And so they did. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, the new podcast from Dateline and Keith Morrison. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Sunday Sit Down with Willie Geist podcast. It's the conversations you want to have with the people you'd love to meet. Get your money's worth. Unedited, unfiltered. See ya. Sit down with Willie and listen wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. What kid, or adult for that matter, doesn't absolutely love chocolate? So these cupcakes are going to be the perfect end to my niece's birthday party. The cupcakes themselves are delicious, but what really puts us over the top is my chocolate hazelnut buttercream. Let's get started on the cake. So we're gonna start with all of the dry goods right in my stand mixer. Two and two thirds cup of all-purpose flour. We wanna make sure we have the right amount of flour. Baking is not the time to start eyeballing things. Then, to start the show, some cocoa powder. This is a really high quality cocoa powder, which is very important because it is one of the key ingredients. And I'm adding a generous amount, three quarters of a cup worth. Now, my niece is very sweet, so we need to put a lot of sugar in this. One and a half cups of just plain granulated sugar. And then for some additional moisture and extra sweetness, a half a cup of light brown sugar. Flop. And just the last few dry ingredients. First, some leaveners, which will give the cupcakes a great crumb and some nice lift. I'm doing one and a half teaspoons each of baking soda and baking powder. And then finally, one and a half teaspoons of some kosher salt. And that's all of the dry ingredients. Throw your paddle attachment on and just mix this until it's well combined. That looks great. Let's get working on the wet ingredients. So I have a four cup liquid measuring cup here with a half a cup of vegetable oil and I'm going to add two large eggs that are at room temp and just whisk to combine. Perfect. Going to add some flavoring, one teaspoon of vanilla, and then I'm going to add one cup of whole milk. Just drizzling that in, starting to combine, make a nice emulsion. I'm going to put my stand mixer on low and just drizzle in my wet ingredients. And it's going to form a pretty thick batter, almost paste-like consistency.
You want it to be well combined. Make sure there's no clumps of dry ingredients left at the bottom of your bowl or along the sides. And then just give it one more gentle mix. At this point, I have one last ingredient and it's one cup of hot coffee. You can also use hot water here, but I really like how the coffee and chocolate notes play off of each other. You really won't even know it's in there. You're going to add this in four equal additions, about a quarter cup at a time, really making sure that the consistency of the batter is uniform before adding the next. It's a really important step. And the last quarter cup. You can see it's considerably thinner. It's just this beautiful velvety batter. Now this makes 24 cupcakes. I like to use a piping bag. So I'm putting about half the batter into a piping bag. And then I have two 12 cavity cupcake pans that are lined with cupcake liners. So carefully fold up your piping bag. Twist it to lock. And then you wanna fill each of these up about two thirds of the way full. This batter is also enough if you wanted to make an actual cake to make two eight or nine inch cake rounds. Cupcake liners are all filled with this gorgeous, luscious batter. And all we need to do is bake it at 350 degrees for about 18 minutes until a toothpick comes out cleanly when inserted into the center. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. In the city of angels, two kindly old ladies wanted to help homeless men get off the streets forever. And so they did. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, the new podcast from Dateline and Keith Morrison. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it, I know that it can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Sunday Sit Down with Willie Geist podcast. It's the conversations you want to have with the people you'd love to meet. Get your money's worth. Unedited, unfiltered. See ya. Sit down with Willie and listen wherever you get your podcasts. My cupcakes are out of the oven. They're completely cooled. You want to give it at least 45 minutes, depending on how cool your kitchen is. Now I'm going to make one of my favorite frostings, a Swiss meringue buttercream. It's super velvety. It's not overly sweet. It's not overly buttery. It's just the perfect combination, in my opinion. And it's pretty simple to make if you can master just a few relatively simple techniques. The first thing we need to do is crack four egg whites into a stand mixer bowl. And it's really important that it's just the egg whites and no yolks, otherwise they won't whip up. I'm going to add just a couple more ingredients. Three quarters cup of granulated sugar and a half a teaspoon of kosher salt. And then with a whisk, mix just to combine. Now I have a small saucepan with just about an inch of simmering water and this is going to create a double boiler. I'm gonna place this right on top and begin whisking. What this does is allow this mixture to start gently heating up and the sugar will melt into it and it's gonna get really light and fluffy 
and this is the beginnings of our Swiss meringue. You can see it's already starting to lighten in color. Just keep whisking the mixture constantly so that it heats evenly. You'll see it's already beginning to lighten in color slightly. It'll keep lightening as you incorporate more air. And you wanna cook this until when you grab some and rub it, you don't feel granules of sugar. Okay, at this point, remove it from the heat and put it right onto your stand mixer. It's fitted with the whisk attachment and just let it go until it's cool to the touch. It's gonna take a couple of minutes. It's gonna get nice and thick. It's almost gonna look like marshmallow cream. Okay, so you can see how thick this Swiss meringue is. It is pretty much room temperature at this point. You don't want it to be warm to the touch because we're going to start adding butter and we don't want it to melt into the meringue. So with the machine on low, medium low, I have a half a pound of unsalted butter and I'm just gonna start grabbing little pieces. And at this point, you may notice that the meringue starts to deflate. That's because we're adding fat. At most, a tablespoon at a time. As we add the butter and it emulsifies, the texture is gonna change right before your eyes. And there it goes, you hear it, the sound just changed as the butter is really starting to emulsify. And at this point, I actually wanna to switch to the paddle attachment, which will smooth this out and remove any excess air. At this point, it's pretty much a blank canvas. It's nice and sweet and buttery, but this is where we need to add some flavor. And I'm using some Nutella. You can use any chocolate hazelnut spread here as long as it's creamy. You don't want any of the oily stuff or it'll break your buttercream. So I'm going to add a half a cup and then just mix it to combine. That's it. We now have chocolate hazelnut buttercream. I like to come in and give it just one more quick stir to make sure everything's fully incorporated. It's super smooth, super creamy, and I promise you it is super delicious. So I have a piping bag that's fitted with a medium-sized star tip, and I'm just going to transfer my buttercream so that I can decorate my cupcakes. These are so pretty that I feel like they deserve a special display. There you have it. Chocolate cupcakes with chocolate hazelnut spread buttercream. And I love how there just happens to be a couple left over for me. How do you eat a cupcake? I'm one of these people. You know when something's so good, you just have nothing to say? I have nothing to say. Chocolatey goodness all day long. My niece will be good for about two or three of these. I cannot wait to share these cupcakes with my niece and my family. Football's back, and so is our special series. Today, food loves football. All season long, we're going to be bringing you tasty recipes in honor of the Sunday night game here on NBC. This week, Chicago Bears against the LA Rams out on the West Coast. Joining us, we got JJ Johnson of Field Trip Restaurant right here at 30 Rock. 
But JJ, bear with me. Before we get to the recipes, let's just wrap up our tailgating bracket. A few min moments ago, I mentioned nachos won the title, took down cheeseburgers, it crushed wings in the semifinals. And that was welcome news to Savannah Guthrie, who <laughs> saw her dreaded bones with sauce, as she refers to wings, go down in flames. Right. But I've been on a mission, a mission to convince Savannah that wings are actually wonderful. <laughs> we have a plate of wings for you. You obviously have gotten bad wings in your life, so hopefully these will be good for you. There, <laughs> There's buffalo sauce, there's, there's, uh, there's blue it? cheese. Yeah. So please, smell them, Do take them all it? in, Savannah. And let me give you just a quick history lesson. Uh -oh. Wings I... were born in 1964 by the co-owner <laughs> of the Anchor Bar yes. in Buffalo, New York. As yes. the story goes, she accidentally ordered chicken wings instead of chicken necks, needed to find a way to use them. The creation was put on the menu, became a hit, and the rest is history. According to the American Chicken Council, we eat 1.3 billion wings leading up to and during the Super Bowl alone. So Savannah, let me just help you out on this quest. Here are five reasons why wings are wonderful. To start, they're the perfect group food. Like you can get a big plate of wings and share it easily with That's a big so group. Funny. Yes. Number two, wings have a higher skin to meat percentage than any other no. part of the chicken. Really? <laughs> Three, There's wings no are mechanically <laughs> appealing to human beings because of the bone and the size. You can eat a lot of wings without any hassle to get to the good stuff, yeah. like crab legs right or fish, right? Number four, <laughs> they're wings. Who else has wings? Yes. Angels. Uh, Number five. Good. <laughs> wings are American with humble roots. They're meant to be shared, and they come with the promise of spending quality time with your people. I'm telling you, friends, family, maybe your partner, most importantly, your kids. Savannah Guthrie, wings are indeed one. Carson Daly, a round of applause. Well, 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 you know. No, I mean, I love wings. You're a professional in the business. <laughs> I, I love wings. Everybody should have wings. You should have wings for Super Bowl with I your guess. family, I everything. Yes. But Preach, I didn't, brother. I didn't make wings because your wings look delicious. I'm doing some nachos. Okay. We're gonna get to. Did you eat a wing yet, Savannah? I did, and I have to say, when I did Better? actually get chicken, it was good. But I got a lot of bone. I'm you sorry, push it was it. bones with sauce. It's how she eats it. Al sure had a had a yeah, turn. Yeah, you have to like, bite like, it. Turn it. Turn on the cob. You got to turn it a little bit. Open up your real estate. Yeah. Okay. You got to open it. Good. And also, oh, angels with wings do? is really amazing. That's the right part of the wing is the bone. Well, we got nachos, cheeseburger. Let's talk about football on Sunday though, JJ, because we got the Rams out in LA. You're, what, what, you got nachos and you're going to do? I'm doing a little bit of plantain nachos. Mm. This is hype. This, this is, is like some pork butt. Thruster. Pork mm. butt. We're going to braise it in beer because it's football wow. season. Mm. So mm. I got some pork butt here. Why pork butt? It's just fatty. It's delicious. It mm. takes in all the Perfect. flavor that you want. And, mm. you know, we're going to use a little bit of celery, carrots, mm. chili. I'm a spicy guy, so. Wow. We're gonna throw this all in your pot. And you can do this all earlier, right? And just kind of prep it before you, you can load do this the nachos. All, from the all earlier. If you have kids, you can let this so rock. Good. If you forget about it, it's gonna be okay. Mm. We're gonna add in the beer here. I just wanna bring this up to a Any little bit of Any particular beer? You like a darker beer? Does it matter? I think whatever beer you like. What do you have here? We have some Goose Island IPA, right? right? Yep. Cheers. Cheers. Delicious. You should cook with what you drink. So, okay. chicken stock. We'll bring that up to a simmer. A little tomato paste, mm -hmm. and then we'll throw the pork right in and top it off. But so let's good. get into the, to the flavor. So it's really good. We got some avocado crema here, mm -hmm. some yogurt, a little bit of garlic, lemon juice. Now, my friends always ask me, how do you cut the avocado right. like this? I don't want anybody holding the avocado in their hand in the air that anymore. Right through. Just right here on the cutting board, yep. roll it around really nice. Right, clear the digits. <laughs> there you go. Boom. Boom. Beautiful. All right. Look okay. Good tip there. Mix this around. Now, this isn't your average plant. This isn't your average nachos. We're taking plantain chips. This yeah. is genius. So right? good. Okay, Yummy. so plantain chips. Look at this here. Look at the pork, everybody. It's, it's delicious. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Just spread this all around. Is that Come on. Beer, now, no. <laughs> it cooked in beer. Okay, so no. Wow, that's great. But if you're a vegetarian, you don't need the pork. No, it's sure, it's vegan, so good. You don't need you're the right. pork. Yeah. Add your black you're not beans. You're doing chips. You're just doing plantain chips. Just as your just, no, but okay. you can put the black beans. You can put you and can the use avocado, avocado yogurt crema, here. Some avocado cheese. crema. Mm. Mm. It's really good. Uh, cheese. I hear it's really good over there. It is it's magnificent. Delicious. Look at this. The plantain chips are genius. This is Monterey cheddar Jack. Monterey Jack. It makes it a little different. If you like spice right here, pickle jalapenos. Throw those on top. Oh yeah. Okay. JJ. That's Come awesome. On. That is I, nacho I, I would, on another you, level. These should have been in the competition. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> these right here. Nacho average nachos. Not your average nachos. Oh, my beer. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. 
Delish. All right. How do you how do you do your burgers? I uh, just throw them on the grill. Probably like an 80-20 mix. Okay. Uh, content. 80-20 mix is what it's about. I want everybody to start going to your butcher shop. Okay. I want you to get chuck, short rib. Have oh. them add in a little bit oh, more yeah. fat. Yep. But the most important part when you're with the burger is making sure it is even so it cooks evenly. So get that ice cream scoop, scoop it out. Mm. Use some ring molds. Yeah. I didn't know that. So don't have a ball, make it flat and no, even. No, right here, get the ice cream scoop right here. Okay. Put it in the, get your so ring again, mold, oh, wow. scoop it in, yep. pack process. it in like this. Rings. Again, this What's is a in here? family activity. Chuck or something this, or? Is, this is 80 20, your 80 -20. favorite. Okay, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, but I see bacon chuck. burgers now. People put short rib. They're, you they're do a little brisket. You can like mix it. Brisket. You can mm. take the pork that you braise yep. in the and nachos and throw it in here. Talking. I am a, I am a cast iron guy though. Yeah, I like cast iron. Okay. Use it on the gar barbecue also. I like to put it right on the grill. Yep. Oh. Yep. Put your cast iron pan right on you the do grill. That, yeah, I do. It's yeah. good. Al do. knows, right? Yeah. And then you get that going as you're melting your cheese. Mm -hmm. Turn the heat up, phenomenal. but then bring the top to get that cheese to melt. Yes, sir. That's a really important part. How are we going to elevate this cheeseburger? Okay. So, my kids like to put French fries on their burgers. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I like to put hot Cheetos. Oh, hot Cheetos. Wow. Hot That's Cheetos on the is. burger. Come on. Cheetos. They're so okay. good. Hot Cheetos Let's on the go. burger. It's good. good. It's fantastic. Savannah. Caramelized oh, onions. Amazing. And the burger itself is good, too. So, I mean, hot it's just Cheeto yes. on the burger. Look a at this caramelized combo. onions. If you don't like hot Cheetos, you can use gumbo spice. Stop. Doritos? There's so much. Yeah, you can do Doritos. That's fun. Look at this. The Great onions flavor. are fantastic. The what? So creative. So good. Yeah, I got to cheers you for this one. Oh my gosh. JJ, yet again, you have crushed it. We're going to be thinking about the Sunday night football game. Bears. <laughs> Food is bad. Out in Los Angeles. Loaded nachos. Elevated with the, the beef. Uh, the pork butt. Oh my gosh, plantain chips. Uh, this is crazy. And we're going to have you come downstairs to field trip. We're right here at 30 Rock. Come right downstairs yeah. to the concourse. Yeah. We love to have you. If you want these recipes, and why wouldn't you, today.com slash food. Also, the whole history of the chicken wing <laughs> is there too. You know what? Hey, you yeah. know what else has wings? What? Bats. <laughs> and nobody likes bats. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. In the city of angels, two kindly old ladies wanted to help homeless men get off the streets forever. And so they did. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, the new podcast from Dateline and Keith Morrison. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. back with Today Food Loves Football. And it's extra special this morning because for the first time in quite a while, we're getting to sample the menu here on the plaza. That's right, baby. Sunday night clash, a great one. Buffalo Bills taking on the Kansas City Chiefs and here with the perfect dishes to enjoy while you watch the game, our good buddy, Mr. Matt Abdu. Yes, that sir. Is the, uh, owner and chef of Pig Beach, one of your favorite spots. I tell you, every Father's Day, we're at Pig you. Beach. I love you, back, brother. What are we making? Well, it's, we it's game time, right? Yes. And by game time, I mean it's time to be making all these incredible dishes to represent my 
high upstate New York route to the Buffalo Bills, right? Yes. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is Buffalo's famous for their buffalo wings. Absolutely. But well, we're gonna take that and extrapolate it into a delicious dip where yep. everybody can just dive on in. So Craig, if you wouldn't mind, we got some celery here to dice up. He also, Matt and also brought some nice beer. Too. Is this, is this beer Utica from, Club beer? Uh, I wish it was There's Utica Club. I need to get some, some Utica Club down here. It's actually Saranac, another upstate okay. New York root beer All right, where there I've you come go. from. So we love you guys from upstate. Craig, doing a great job with that celery. So in our bowl here, mm -hmm. we have some chicken. This is right. rotisserie chicken that I just picked all the meat and I chopped it all up. Makes it easy. Makes it super easy. If you want, you can substitute that chicken in a can, just drain it off, chop it off, or whatever sort of leftover chicken you have. Some cream cheese, shredded cheddar cheese, and some blue cheese dressing. Oh, is this gonna go in there? Yes, yeah, so we're gonna take all, all those. All the basic ingredients. All the, of, of exactly, buffalo all the stuff that you want. And then we're gonna add some for some texture and some brightness, some crunch, all the banana peppers that got chopped oh, up. Yeah. Some celery, we're gonna put it all into this bowl and mix it together. Yeah. And what I love about this is that you're getting all that delicious okay, buffalo flavor, that cheesiness and that goodness, right. but the banana peppers and the celery add some crunch. So and now we gotta add our hot, hot sauce. sauce. Uh, what kind of hot sauce do you use? Um, is that I, proprietary? I, well, it's not proprietary at all. If I'm allowed to say it, I'm a huge sure. fan of Frank's Red Hot. I okay. love Frank's for Buffalo like Wings. It's sort of like the original OG one. So you're just gonna take this all and mix it together. Mm -hmm. You wanna make sure your cream cheese is nice and tempered so it's soft. Right. And you're gonna mix it together until it comes to this sort of form right here. Now, this cheese dip. We're gonna take it, put it in a casserole pan, bake it in the oven at 350 degrees, put okay. a little shredded cheddar cheese and crumble blue cheese on top right. until it's just super bubbly and warm and delicious and gooey, mm -hmm. and you have your buffalo chicken cheese dip ready right. to go. Yes. But what's awesome about this dip is it also makes an incredible mm. sort of you are repurposing it. We're repurposing it. We can take it and also put it into a pizza dough, which we have here. We just have a store-bought pizza dough that you can get anywhere in your grocery stores. Yeah. So what do you think, ladies? Cool. You can put it on a burger, that. too. Yes, you can. That. that might be the new thing. I love you guys. Actually, this one, you can double dip. Double dip, hit it. I like your style, yeah, Mr. Rocker. That's a oh, fantastic yeah. move. What do you call this? So this is my buffalo chicken cheese bread. So we're just going to oh, take so that good. same buffalo chicken dip filling. We're going to put it into a prepared is. pizza dough. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a little egg wash. Oh, my God. Wash the eggs out. Side. We're going to leave about an inch on that pizza dough. Like That's the glue. genius. Yes, yeah, like the glue. And then we're just going to take this dough and really simply we're going to take the outside ends, oh, fold fantastic. it in. Boom. Just like this and do a quick fold and a quick okay. roll. Now this might take a little bit of practice for you guys at home if you haven't been familiar with some dough. I'm just going to take it and roll it up just Amazing. really nice and quick wow. like that. Yeah. Like a stromboli. Right on the same pan. Right on the same pan. We're going to hit the top with a little bit of egg wash. That's what's going to oh get it all God. nice just and golden brown. Beaten up egg there. And then we're yeah. going to make some nice vent holes and bake it in your oven at about 450 right. degrees. So it's nice and golden brown and you have this, this delicious. This is fantastic. So there's Buffalo. Let's go to Buffalo. Kansas, Kansas, Kansas City. Representing Kansas City, we have our Kansas City cheesy corn. So in our pot yeah. right here, we have a little... Oh. Yeah, Kansas City! Where are my buffalo people? Where are my buffalo people? All right, so to our pot, we're going to add in our chopped garlic, some rendered bacon. Mm -hmm. We're going to get all the aromatic and beautiful. Smells some good. corn. If you have fresh corn, great. If not, you can use frozen, frozen. corn. You can use canned corn. doesn't really matter because what's really important about this is all the other goodies that we're going to put in here. Some milk, some uh, cheese. Shredded oh, cheddar that cheese. Was that Velveeta? That sure is Velveeta and some cream Velveeta. cheese. Wow. Nothing wrong with Velveeta. And a little bit of butter. And you know what? It melts perfectly. It's incredible. So we're going to take all this, melt it all together, mm -hmm. and then at the end, we're going to pour it into our cassoulet dish just like this. Top it off with some more shredded cheddar cheese oh because God. football season is all about the cheese. What say you ladies? Oh, my God. We're incredible. We're Amazing. dying. Get By the way, get to the ribs. Get to get the ribs. Get to the ribs. Right. ribs. So, so, Kansas City, <laughs> probably one of the most famous regions for Kansas City-style oh, barbecue so sauce, sweet, mm -hmm. sticky, molasses-based, brown sugar. Ketchup based barbecue what sauces. Makes, what makes Take your it time. Like a Take Kansas your time. City rib. It's that it's sweet. It's okay. got a nice, sweet, sticky flavor and texture to it. So the That's sauce is basically cool. made with molasses, brown sugar, ketchup, a little apple cider vinegar. Mix it all together, make a delicious barbecue sauce. And these ribs are an oven recipe for you guys at home. Oh. So if you don't have a smoker, you can all you're gonna make them at your home uh -huh. oven, which makes it really easy. And you can make this ahead of time. Yes, and then warm absolutely. Them up. And then throw them on the grill. Get some beautiful grill marks on them, just like that. And then while they're on the grill, we're just gonna take some of that sweet, oh, sticky really Kansas City style oh. barbecue oh. sauce. Worth it. Give them a good glance. Right? So yeah. good. I mean, how good is that? That's like fall off the bone. Too. That's what, what we want. What do you nice say, ladies? Sticky, like, fall off the yeah, bone. We're sharing, we're sending the ribs around to everybody. Come on. Yo, we want yo, people to have it. I know you want it. Just take it. So it's good. The guys are dying. Thing is amazing. So good. Like Thank every you. single piece. It's so great to see Matt. you guys. What better what way kind to of beer did you choose? Uh, Saranac, upstate New York roots, where we love. Maybe wherever you are out there, we got some upstate New York beer represented on the plaza today. Saranac, we love it. We love it. We love you, man. Well, we love you guys. Thank you so much for having me. This is always such an honor to be here. And football season. Is here, so let's eat. Oh That's yes. right. So, yeah. Woo! I assume you're, you're pulling for Josh and the Bills on Sunday. Uh, you know, I always root for the upstate New York. Oh, you gotta team. Go I gotta go. Even gotta though go. I've been in the city now for a long time. Suny Oswego. That's, That's right. Suny Geneseo. Yeah. Suny Oswego. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta go for upstate yeah. New York. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah
This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. I believe, I believe. Every dream, every journey, every triumph. And it all starts here. Let the celebration begin! The excitement is in the air. The United States, States wins the Is he superhuman? Feel the magic every day. She is a superstar. <laughs> Kayla, we are cheering you we are. on. Sean White! And share every moment with us at the Winter Olympics. Today, today, today. Today, today is where the games begin. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? The Sunday Sit Down with Willie Geist podcast. It's the conversations you want to have with the people you'd love to meet. Get your money's worth. Unedited, unfiltered. See ya. Sit down with Willie and listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. And we're back with today, Food Loves Football, to get you ready for the big Sunday night battle here on NBC. Pittsburgh Steelers, L.A. Chargers, here to get us in the spirit with some game day eats. Cookbook author and restaurant owner, Adrian Calvo. Adrian, thank you for being here. Oh it's Shirley out on the plaza. Hi. Savannah joins Woo. us. We're going to start with this beautiful Italian sandwich. Yes, an outrageous Italian sandwich. It is outrageous. Maximum flavor style. Lots of flavors. We have here some ciabatta bread, some fresh mozzarella. Yep. Got to use the fresh stuff. Mm. We're going to cut that into about quarter inch pieces. Okay. Now, don't skimp on the fresh stuff. Building yes. ingredients, using great ingredients is, is That the makes secret. a difference. Yeah. Why do you like the yeah. ciabatta? The chewiness, but the lightness of it as well. But yep. you know, any rustic Italian bread really will do. Mm -hmm. So okay. you get some pesto down? Pesto down on both sides. <laughs> I need a mm. chainsaw <laughs> for this. And then we're gonna start pressing our meats. Now I like to use pepperoni, prosciutto, salami, mm. but guess what? You have turkey and ham left over for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Swap that out, okay? Do I do so, a layer on the cheese now? Stuff. Please, layer it here. We have some sliced oh. up as oh, well. Geez, okay. Yes. Oh, Adrian, that is that's Isn't that fantastic? fantastic? So we lay on some this? peppers, pepperoncini. It should look like this. We press it. it smells so good. With something heavy in the fridge overnight. Oh, the skillet. The skillet goes on like this. Yep. Okay. Is you this have, a Pittsburgh thing? Yes. You oh, have, look at that. Gorgeous. Look at this, guys. <laughs> that's yes. my half, that's half. Yeah. I like that. This is I like delicious. That. <laughs> Next. Ooh. You know, it's not football without a queso, without a cheese dip, oh, yes. right? That's right. So we have here some chorizo, okay? Now we're going to use some Oaxaca cheese or, you know, any any type of creamy, melty cheese mm -hmm. will work, okay? So we saute it like so uh -huh. over medium-high heat. Okay. Now the flavors really come out here. This is one of the most important stuff. Okay. So now we, just to get a good mm, saute of the chorizo first. We have exactly. our tasting okay. table, guys. How is the now, Pittsburgh sandwich? Here, it's good. we're like going that? to add it to a casserole dish. Mouth You're moving it into a casserole dish. Exactly. Okay. Now we're going. <laughs> now we're adding our. There you go. We're adding no. our Oaxaca cheese our Oaxaca or Oaxaca any cheese. melty cheese. Exactly. You mm -hmm. can mix cheeses as well too. Oh, sure if can. you can't get that type of cheese, provolone works well. Okay. Goes into the oven until it's nice and melty. Oh yeah. Melty. Yes. Serve it with tortilla chips okay. and some pico de gallo or oh, some yes. salsa. So delicious. That's maximum oh, really? flavor. It's so cold it kind of froze. Yes. It's supposed to be hot. It's super cold okay. here. I know. Yeah, All right. Well. No. Okay. What's next? Next, we have our cheeseburger tots, mm -hmm. which Wait, are cheeseburger tots. Cheeseburger tater tots. Yeah. You see? All it right. grabs your attention right away. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we have some ground beef, 
some mm -hmm. onions, and who doesn't like onions and ground Oh my gosh, right? All the so things. You saute that. Actually, you want to saute this for me? Oh, sure. Okay. If you think I can. Oh, absolutely. We're going to okay. add mayo right to the pan. Mm -hmm. Oh, mayo. Some interesting. Relish. And this is just ground beef and onions, right? Yep. Okay. Mustard. Not that you'd want to, but you could do ground turkey if you wanted to. Exactly. Or yeah. chicken. Okay. 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 So we saute that together. Here we have our tater tots. You're good. That's perfect. Okay. Oh, do you uh, want me to mix it more? Yeah. Mix yeah, it okay. until it's well How do you combined. make the tater tot a vessel for this burger meat? Here's the secret, guys. This is the secret. You use something like this, and you press the already baked tater tot. Oh, you make a shell. I do. Oh, make you a make shell. the shell. Oh, it's just the back of a I mean, potato yes. spoon thing. Exactly. Oh, if all else oh, yeah. fails, your thumb. Yeah, now, no. that stuffing okay. goes into okay. the potato. Yes. All right? And then we top it off, oh, you got okay, the with some pickles, pickle or mm. yes. some oh, secret sauce. Now, are you baking this more, or is this yes, just, okay? Yes, we're going to bake it a little bit more. Oh, my God. Okay? Pickle, yeah. pickle goes on top, yeah. like so. Now imagine all these flavors, secret sauce, pickle. It tastes pickle. like a Big Mac. Yes. Now the potato, oh, the brown What are those little mm -hmm. seeds? Sesame seeds. Oh, sesame seeds. That's okay. like your bun that yes. has, you know, the sesame seeds on top. How's it oh, taste, you guys? Carson, oh, you left God. the segment. You're just over there it's eating. These thoughts are the truth. So and if you have any of these left, pop them out as hors d'oeuvres for Thanksgiving. That's oh. so fun. Right? <laughs> I love it. What do you think, guys? So Is that maximum flavor? Insane. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well done, Joe. Insane. The queso's off. My queso right. was frozen. All right, awesome. Yeah, but these are great. But it's good cold, too. And mm -hmm. it's all easy. Anybody mm -hmm. can I do told this. You. That is all right. delicious. All right. Okay, Adrian. You nailed it. Thank you so much. If you want to get more on these That's recipes, incredible. go to today.com slash food. Oh, for the beer, right? You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. I believe, I believe. Every dream, journey, and triumph. And it all starts here. United States, let's go! Feel the magic every day. The excitement is in the air. At the Winter Olympics, today is where the games begin. You got that magic. You got that magic. In the City of Angels, two kindly old ladies wanted to help homeless men get off the streets forever. And so they did. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, the new podcast from Dateline and Keith Morrison. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It is Superfood Friday, and we are celebrating the return of football. And here to get us tailgate ready is today nutritionist Joy Bauer, showing us two dishes you can tackle on game day. Joy, good morning. I love the whole setup here. Oh, good morning, guys. Welcome to my tailgate. And by the way, <laughs> people are set up in a stadium parking lot or like me parked in their driveway or on their comfy couch. I have two hearty, delicious food ideas. Okay. I hope you're going to love it. Well, I see you've got a pot sitting on the grill. Uh, what, what's, what are you making in that? So I'm going on record to say this is the easiest chili on the planet. It just requires three ingredients and it comes together in 10 minutes flat. Okay. So, wow. oops, lost my earphone. <laughs> so, I'm starting here with lean ground turkey meat and mm -hmm. it was just about one pound and I ground it. And it can also be sirloin or it can be lentils if you prefer. Next, I'm adding in this is one can of rinsed grained beans. And now for, for the MVP of the chili. So this is a 16 ounce jar of salsa and it's gonna do all of the oh. flavoring for you. This mm. is basically the hack here. You just stir this all together and normally That's I would how say, I make it. Oh, pick up any salsa that would be on sale, but really here, the salsa is bringing all the flavor to your pot. 
the onions, the garlic, the peppers. Mm -hmm. And so you really want to pick your absolute favorite brand. It's, mm -hmm. it's sort of like the MVP of the whole entire chili over here. Full disclosure, then, that's how I make my chili all the time. And it's quick and it works and it's yummy. Um, so here's the thing. That couldn't be easier, but if you take so, What just happened there? Oh, I'm wow. so, so, so here I have like a bowl of chili, but... I'm gonna turn it into chili dogs because here I took lean poultry sausage, I put it in whole grain buns, and I put the chili and some cheddar on top. Guys, I'm telling you, like football dance worthy. Yum. <laughs> that looks so good. Looks so, so, what if you want it a little spicy? If you want it sort of like bold enough, a classic chili flavor and bring some smokiness to the pot, I would add some chili powder and ground cumin. You could add a little bit of at a time and taste it and, you know, sort of go from there. But I'm telling you, it's like three Looks ingredient good. chili that delivers big on taste. Okay. I think you'll really like it. All right. I, I know you also have a spin on some BLTs. How, how are you making these? Yeah, so this is like a fun spin on a beloved classic, the BLT, and basically it's salad on a stick. Oh. <laughs> I've taken the formula, the bacon, lettuce, and tomato, and I skewered it and, and created kebabs. So this is turkey bacon. It's lower in fat. It's higher in protein. I've got my lettuce. I have cherry tomatoes, and I did three layers of it here. It's a great way to get sort of finicky eaters or salad haters to get on board because it becomes <laughs> Put it on fun. a stick, yeah. And it's then brutal. I have my... <laughs> then I have a creamy uh, ranch dressing. Mm. You could um, simplify the recipe and just buy a favorite store-bought or I'm going to put on Instagram and I have on today.com a do-it-yourself, super lightened up, but thick and delicious ranch Ooh, dressing that, that people could good. check That's out. Great. And you can either... Pour it oh. over and drizzle your kebabs, or you can let people dunk it. And then I have some chives. That's cute. But it's it's like like I, I want to know how, I mean, how again, you actually the game eat, it, eat so it. So easy, so delicious. But again, football dance worthy. I'm going to show you That's these cute. two things. Salad oh, on a stick. That's, That's awesome. It. Learn something go. every day. I, I, I lost my audio. Yeah, oh, she lost oh, my audio. Because I wanted to Thank know how you, exactly you eat the BLT. All right, well, you, you make it. I'm so sorry. I it's can't okay. Hear no you worries. Guys. But you, you, everything looks fantastic. And we love when you freeze and then speed up. Yeah, like that. no. that's fantastic. That freaked me that's out. Great. I was like, was, Woo! That, was that human? Like, did that just happen? She's got like a robot. <laughs> Al's not human either. Um, thanks, Joy, for these recipes. Head to today.com slash food. We'll be right back. I was like, whoa. And we're back with today's Food Loves Football. It's the Titans and Rams Sunday night. And if you want new game day eats to try, you're in luck. Cookbook author and food blogger Gabby Dawkins is here with a few favorites. Not a lot of time. Let's get right into it. Right Representing into it. the Rams, what are we going to start with? We're going to make some L.A.-inspired fish tacos. So we just have some, like, cod. You could use salmon, any kind of flaky white fish. Yep. And we're going to just season it with any sort of, like, all-purpose seafood seasoning. You want to go ahead and give that? Well, I'll just drizzle it with a little olive oil. Yep. We're short on time. Love it. Um, okay, and so then we're just going to take this and grill it. If you live somewhere where you have like an outdoor grill, go for it. Mm -hmm. The key to grilling fish is you want to put it on a hot grill because otherwise it'll stick. Yeah, go ahead and season and how that. how long will this cook for? That's going to cook for about three to four minutes on each side. Don't try and switch, like flip it until it releases it and like so it's ready to go. Once that's done, we're going to make it with a little smashed avocado, like faux guacamole situation. Yep. So we just are going to dice some chives. I'll let you throw those into Got a little it. bit of avocado. Okay. Perfect. You could use cilantro, whatever, and then I'll give you a fork. Season that with a little salt, pepper, a little bit of lime juice. Perfect. That's great. And you don't want to probably do too much, right? You want to let the fish You're kind of the stand fish out. Shine, taste but you it. want like a little bit of avocado. I love it's the cilantro. LA. Then we have some like charred tortillas, flour tortillas, corn tortillas, whatever you want. Go ahead and flip it. Yeah, go ahead. That's You're not right. ready yet. Okay. We've got some done over here. So I'm gonna grab this spoon. Once you have your fish done, you're just gonna kind of fling Ooh, it look off. look at that, looks delicious. When, it, when it's ready to go, it's perfectly flaked. Just go All right, how's the fish avocado. tacos, gang? Oh, we got the good. They, they are good. I got some salt on it and some lime juice. Refreshing. Yeah, a little Ooh, limey, wow. I like yep. it. Gabby, yeah, that's fantastic. And you can serve it with some poblano style queso. Wow. Delicious. Okay. Like an LA street tacos, great. Right? Yep. Okay, so now we're gonna make some sweet potato fries. If you have a mandolin, just use it to thinly slice your sweet potatoes. Uh -huh. You can use any kind of sweet potatoes you want. Oh, sweet potato. Then these are gonna go right into frying oh, cool. liquid. 
Those are going to cook for about a couple minutes on each side. The spices really got some chicken. I like it. The spices yeah. terrific. Big barbecue sauce. Oh, so once wow. it's done, you take them out and you just season this with a little barbecue sauce. Well, that is delicious. Yeah. And serve it up with some tea-soaked <laughs> chicken thighs. Chicken Gabby, legs. To you. Cheers. Three minutes, hey. two meals. I mean, well done. I've never oh cooked so bad in my you life. Did, you crushed it. <laughs> Gabby, thank you. The recipe today, Dr. We are back with Today Food Loves Football, and we have the perfect spread for the big game. Chef Donatella Arpaia is here, and she's launching a new healthy cooking show on her Instagram channel in January. Yes. Good morning. Good now morning. I, morning. Now, I know you're launching a healthy cooking show. <laughs> Today, we're splurging a little bit yes. because it's the end of the year, yeah. and I, I, I said to her in the green room, I'd rather take two bites of something really awesome Absolutely. than eat a whole plate of blah. So, I'm yes. with you. So, right. let's start. So, we are known for my meatballs, so we are making a mega meatball calzone. Okay. Because we want party food. So, here is the meatball, the mixture, and... If you want to go turkey, you can replace this recipe what did with you turkey. Use? I used beef, parmesan, fresh garlic, fresh parley, parsley, egg, salt, pepper. Impossible meat could be used too and for people who don't eat. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's a good you idea. You can absolutely yeah. replace my recipe with impossible meat. I've used it. I have it on my website. It's with great. the same ingredients. Like, same exact ingredients. Yep. Just switch. Okay. And then you want to pan sear it. I don't like baking meatballs. I like frying them. You want that golden crust. Okay, and then and it's then not mushy. Just, and then it's not mushy. Yeah. And then you put it in the sauce. And okay. then we have pizza dough that you can get from your local pizzeria. Okay. Or, or, or the the stores. Sure. And you roll it out. You shape it into a football. And okay. then you start pouring it in. And this is such a crowd pleaser. You know, I've never made a calzone. Really? Should, no. Yeah, me neither. Oh it's my gosh. It, and you know what? Once you learn the premise of this, you can like you do it all the time. Start doing everything. You could fill. Football with, you know, you can do a vegetarian. You could do everything. No, I'm inspired right An now. An interesting tip is that you can call your local pizzeria and just yes, ask for the for dough. The dough. And, I did that really? over the pandemic. Especially yeah. when you love, you know, and it supports them too. If you yeah. love their their dough. It's probably not that expensive either. No, right? it's, it's not. It's okay. dough. Okay. okay. All right. Then we do a little cheese, mm -hmm. a little mascarpone, a little parmesan, a little parsley. Ooh. A mascarpone. Mascarpone is like okay. Italian cream yep, cheese. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, okay, and then we take this. Oh, you do two. Oh, two footballs. No. And you did yours in the shape of a football because, of course. So smart, football, but baseball yes. season? That's cute. Shape of a baseball. Okay, and oh, then. And the little thingies down yes, the middle. just make sure you shape it, okay? okay. That's cute, that's cute. And then. You fold it over. Like fold a... it over so nothing leaks out. And then you make the little oh football strips. Duck. Right there. You bake it in the oven, and then I add garlic and butter. Oh Look at God. this. Because it's kind of like a, gar you know, garlic you butter knots. This, <laughs> this is the most beautiful thing. And then you just slice it, and it's a Oh, my party. God, this is amazing. Jill's a vegetarian, so I should just take your. Oh, no, I eat meat. I just don't eat poultry. Oh, try this. Yeah. It's really good. It's such a fun, fun event. And oh, my just God. because I want something light, you don't want, like, wings and something heavy. Right. Do a beautiful oh winter crudite with my skinny dip. All these vegetables are here. Eat with your eyes. Go to your local farmer's market. I like that. Eat it's with your so, eyes. It's so beautiful presentation because people don't like crudite because it's like that pre-cut dry yeah. vegetable. And pre-cut vegetables cost more money than, than if you buy it yourself. And here's an herb. Okay, here's herbs. Okay. A lot of herbs. So okay. what are we putting in here? We are putting garlic cloves, lemon zest, lemon juice. It smells all these herbs, so good and fresh. Fresh herbs are everything. Okay. You don't miss the fat. Mm -hmm. And then we mince it. We drizzle a little olive oil. We mince it. And then we put it into uh, Greek yogurt. Or oh. if you want, you can use sour cream. But this is healthy and good Try for this. you. I know. I'm not giving and this, this is up. A dip. <laughs> <laughs> I should have started with the crudite and moved on to the calzone well, because now I want to finish. And then you just mix it. it. You this store it for just a couple of hours oh, in the fridge. Oh, that's good. And then you mm. enjoy Oh, it's Enjoy. so fresh. It's so fresh and delicious. You can add heat to it. Try this, And like Jill. I said, it's all about don't buy those dried packets. Thank you. And add it. You know what? Can okay. I tell you something? Don't do the dried packets. You're actually preaching to me because I'm guilty of that. And they're not, not quite the mm. same. Like, this they're is really good. not quite the same. Just add a little salt and pepper. And it feels luscious. Oh, my God. It feels fresh. The whole point is it feels delicious. Oh it feels gosh. like you're cheating. Because, but you yeah, know, comfort. Because it's creamy. It's 
listen, it's football. This is right. an American tradition. We like to eat, but this is great. after eating that beautiful mega calzone, we need some winter crudite. This is and fantastic. it's a great combination. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much thank for being so much. here. Thank you. It's so great to be back. I know. It today's feels show. great, right? Thank you. Okay, and for these recipes, head to today.com slash food. This is a good one. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. I believe, I believe. Every dream, journey, and triumph. And it all starts here. United States, let's go! Feel the magic every day. The excitement is in the air. At the Winter Olympics, today is where the games begin. In the city of angels, two kindly old ladies wanted to help homeless men get off the streets forever. And so they did. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, the new podcast from Dateline and Keith Morrison. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. And we're back with today. Food loves football, and all football fans are going to love the Sunday night oh. matchup. I mean, how could you not? How could you not? You got Tom Brady, of course, spent 20 years as the face of the New England Patriots, returning to Gillette Stadium to take on his old team. And looky, looky, who's already looky, there. Looky. Chanel Jones at Gillette Stadium. What's up, Ask Jones? Hello. Well, whether you're a Pats fan, a Bucks fan, or just a fan of good old game day food, we have the perfect menu for the game. We have Karen Akunowitz. She's a James Beard award-winning chef and owner of Fox and the Knife in South Boston, and she's whipped up some delicious, easy recipes for all of us to make, whether you're tailgating or at home on your couch. Good morning to you. <laughs> Hi, Chanel. How are you? Are you guys ready to eat? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the Patriots. You're a big time fan. Obviously. I'm a big time fan, yeah. absolutely. I mean, the GOAT's coming back to town. Couldn't be happier about it. But you know, when the game starts, it's game time, right? Uh, absolutely. Shall we eat? We shall definitely all eat. All right, let's and talk so about lobster rolls. We do a little sandwich off here. Okay. So a little New England lobster roll. Okay. A little Florida pressed Cubano sandwich. <laughs> okay. A little, you know, uh, to, to celebrate the, the rivalry. Um, we've got New England lobster rolls. Now, there's controversy in New England. Do you eat them with, cold with mayo? Right. Do you eat them hot with butter? So am I horrible for liking it hot with no, butter? No, I love them hot with butter. Okay. But this is the best of both worlds. Okay. This is a little riff on my friends from the Clam Shack in Kennebunk in Maine. Okay. Um, I make the lobster hot with butter. Mm. We toast the roll. Okay. And then we add some tarragon mayo. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, do I add the lobster little, first? Yeah, you put the lobster Look on the bottom lobster. right here. Okay. <laughs> Can I have some lobster yes, while we talk about have it? have some. And you want to get, I like to put, you know, a whole tail on here, get a okay. claw on there. Oh, so you have to load it up. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're going to eat a lobster roll, Absolutely. let's eat a lobster roll, okay. right? All right. I'm going to add a little. So I make a little tarragon mayo. Okay. So this little herby. We're going to put that on the top of the roll. Okay. Is this and easy then, to make? This is so easy. You're going to make this in a blender with an immersion blender. Okay. Or you can just buy some mayo at home, chop up some tarragon. And call and it just, a day. And call it a day. Make okay. it easy. We're going to grab a little arugula. Okay. We're going to put that right on top of the just lobster. Right on the top. Yep, you got it. I wash my hands, promise. Perfect. Okay. We're going to... Mm, Push little this toothpick down there. and little toothpick action. A little bigger than a slider, a little smaller but than a But you know what? You can't beat Perfect it. game day can't size. Okay, so on the other end here, we have the, do I call them Cubano rolls? Cubano, yeah. Cubano? It's a okay. press Cubano. Okay. So you can do these on a panini press or you can do them in a pan. Okay. They're actually great for tailgating because you can warm them, press them at home. Okay. And then they stay pretty, pretty great if they travel. They're also great for a game day spread. We're going to put mustard on both sides. Okay. Easy enough. Easy enough. It also makes for a great spread. Oh People my gosh! Want to pick up something. Also, and go if for you're it. a pescatarian, you eat meat. You don't eat meat. We've got right. we've got something for everyone. Okay. We like to load this up. We like to put cheese on both sides. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
We're gonna, you wanna, we wanna do the pickles? Do the pickles. You pickle on this side. A little crunch. So we're either gonna do roast pork or ham okay. on this side. If you, if you don't go for pork or ham, you could always do turkey. That's okay. a great substitution. Easy enough. We're gonna close this bad boy up. And we're gonna and then throw just it. A good old panini maker. We're gonna throw it right on that press. Okay, so we've got about one minute left in honor of our healthy folks here. We have, especially Giselle and Brady, first Tom of all. Tom and Giselle, Hi. right? If you're a fan, I if feel you're like not a football fan, you're probably a Tom and Giselle fan. Right. So I made this in honor of them. This is a little green goddess dressing that's a little nod to, to Giselle, right? There a little go. goddess dressing <laughs> with some beautiful crudite. And I love to put them in individual cups. This is good, right? especially with COVID, COVID too. Right? Okay. Everyone has their own individual cups. Kids love them. Okay. And, you know, it's a great and fun, delicious way to get some vegetables into your, your football And then how head. do you make the green goddess dip really Green quickly. goddess dip, we're gonna throw it all in a blender. Tarragon, spinach, chervil, parsley, it. yes. Okay. And we whip in a little um, Greek mm. yogurt at the end. Mm. If you're dairy free, you can use a little um, coconut, mm. uh, coconut yogurt, a little coconut cream, and you've got like a delicious herby dairy, dairy free dip. You know what I like about this? It looks healthy, but it still tastes like it's, it's delicious. Right? It feels, yeah, you still feel like, oh, I'm, I'm eating something delicious. Yeah, and it's you're the, the best. Thank you're the best. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Are you ready Thanks for, for Sunday night? Me. I am ready. Do you have tickets to the game? No, I'll be watching uh, from my yeah, couch. Same, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, are you ready for the game? Yeah! It kind of goes without saying. This is really yummy. I feel like I just ran for a touchdown out here on the plaza. After <laughs> the best segment, today food loves football this morning. We're going to get you ready for Sunday night's clash between Seattle Seahawks. <laughs> and the Pittsburgh Steelers here on NBC. That's right. Now, if you're looking for some different snack ideas for the big game, Molly Yeh, an award-winning cookbook author, host of Food Network's Girl Meets Farm, has two easy ones, but they, we cannot wait to try these. Molly, good morning. Hi, Al. Hi, Savannah. Happy football Meat season. Meatball yes. biscuits, you had me at hello. Oh, my gosh. They're meaty, they're cheesy, they're carby. They've yeah. got Everything. all the food groups. Everything. And they're actually really easy. So I'm starting with a great, basic pork meatball. I have my breadcrumbs soaking mm. in the milk. It's going to make them really nice and juicy and moist. Could you do like ground here. turkey or ground chicken if you wanted to? For sure. Okay. Yeah, ground beef, any ground meat. Mm -hmm. um, and then season with some salt and pepper. And then do you want to dump in the seasonings here? What, what do you are got those? I've got garlic, onion. I always like to add fennel seeds to my meatballs because it gives them a sausagey vibe. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit of smokiness and heat with some paprika mm -hmm. and red pepper. Um, that gets mixed up with an egg uh -huh. and some parsley. And uh -huh. if I was at home, I would get in here with my hands and right. mix it up, but I don't want to get my hands dirty on the plaza. Yeah. Okay, we got our meatballs here. These are your little, formed. A little ice cream scoop to make A little them. ice cream scoop so that they're uniformly sized. Okay. And then you just want to sear them on all sides okay. to get that great crust. How hot is that pan? Hot, um, not hot enough right now. Okay. You should hear it sizzle. <laughs> you should when hear you're sizzle. making okay. it at home, you should hear it sizzle. And you get develop that crust because that develops that flavor. And now this is the fun part. This is the part that intimidates me. Do you want to make well, one? No, I want you to do it. Show them, show them okay. how it's really done. So we're basically making a meatball dumpling. Mm -hmm. And I've got my biscuit dough here. I always say the hardest part of making this recipe is opening up that can of biscuit oh, so you dough. Use the store bought I thing. use the store. Okay. I mean, right. it's been homemade meatball. If you wanted to go all in and make a homemade biscuit, go no. right ahead. But no cheese. So you put some cheese in so mm -hmm. it gets nice and melty. Is that mozzarella? Could you use any cheese? That's mozzarella. Any melty cheese. Melty mozzarella, cheese. provolone. Velveeta. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whoa, Al, well, that's awesome. Oh I'm going to use that next time. Okay, pinch the edges to seal. Mm -hmm. These go into a baker. Right. And they can do a little egg wash or something. This is garlic butter. Come on. Oh, stop it. So egg it's wash. like, it's, it's like a whole thing. Behind it. It's like, like, is it good? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's a good breakfast, right? Okay. Yeah, get your protein in. So it's as if these dress up like garlic knots mm -hmm. for Halloween. And how long yeah. do you bake them for? 375, 30 to 40 minutes. Okay. This, this looks so the incredible. There it is. Oh my gosh, yum. Go okay. for it, Al. <laughs> Okay. All right, so All right, Molly, keep that going. was oh. for Pittsburgh wow. for the so Seattle good. Seahawks. Okay, We've for got Seattle. some jalapeno poppers. Nice. They kind of look like footballs and they're mm -hmm. green oh. for mm -hmm. Seahawks. Mm. And the filling is cream cheese, Swiss, mozzarella. It gets really melty. Some pickles. I'm pregnant. Why I'm not? Pickles. <laughs> and then some ham. Mm -hmm. A little bit of paprika and cayenne for that okay. smokiness okay. and heat. And this is just a really flavorful filling. If you wanted to just serve this as a dip with some crackers, it's good. It's good. Let's do the mustard. fast forward because we only have about 45 seconds Okay, left. so we're going to fill these guys mm -hmm. just like Boom. that. Okay. Easy is to do it with a piping bag. Okay. Clean us that way. You could use a Ziploc bag. And then what's the, the frying crust These, thing? okay, 
So they get dredged in flour, egg, and then Ritz crackers. Oh, wow. Oh, I love that. Because buttery is a little uh, sweet. And how are like, they? And then you're going to you're gonna deep fry these at what temperature? It is 365 so until they're golden and crisp. Oh, my God. Guys, so, so the you, meatball biscuit. Who are you voting for? The meatball biscuit is so good. It starts like a meatball hoagie, and then it, ha it finishes like a breakfast biscuit. It's so good. And the popper? Oh, awesome. And it's not too spicy. Not too spicy, so uh -huh. it's good. It's a little good. All right. Keep that's talking. We're eating. Keep, keep, keep <laughs> sorry. And you and finish it off with a nice beer. beer. Very nice. Okay, so Molly. You fry it right in there. It is. Fry it right in here. Oh, that's great. awesome. It's so great to see oh you. Thank you. Thank you, too. Right. Thank you for having me. Go sports. Yes. All right. Go sports. I like that. Just go Go generic sports. Find her recipes on today.com slash food. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? I believe, I believe. Every dream, every journey, every triumph. And it all starts here. Let the celebration begin! The excitement is in the air. Is he superhuman? Feel the magic every day. She is a superstar. <laughs> Kayla, we are cheering you on. Right. And share every moment with us at the Winter Olympics. Today, today, today. Today, today is where the games begin. I believe, I believe. Every dream, journey, and triumph. And it all starts here. Feel the magic every day. The excitement is in the air. At the Winter Olympics, today is where the games begin. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? We are back with Today Food Loves Football to get you ready for Sunday night's big game. The Chiefs taking on the Ravens, a matchup between two of the biggest quarterbacks in the game, of course, Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson. Well, let's talk about the food, shall we? What should you serve? Mark Anderson and Ryan Faye, the grill dads are here. They got Hello. us covered. Hi, guys. Morning. Good morning. Hi, guys. Yay. Good so, morning. Okay. Good morning. Uh, we love, but for me, football is about the food. Oh, oh yeah. Just 100%. Yeah. That's it. So, what are you guys <laughs> making today? I'm going to make a crab cake BLT first Ooh. to celebrate the ultimate winners of this game, oh, which will be on. the Ravens. Come on. Oh, boy, J.K. Dobbins, he's hurt, but uh, we love him. All right. So, well. This crab cake, we turn it into a BLT because mm. any excuse to put bacon on a sandwich we yes. think is a good thing to do. Yeah. So <laughs> let's make our crab cake. We have crab meat that we've shredded up. Um, we've got breadcrumbs. We actually do a little bit more breadcrumb than normal when we're going to grill it because it works as a binder and helps keep it together on the grill. Hmm. Do you guys use real yeah. or some parsley? Wait, what? Oh, that was a good question. Real. Oh, real Especially if you want to yeah. show your face in Baltimore. No. Yeah. I feel like so we have, <laughs> yeah, exactly. we have Old Bay Mayo. Old Bay uh, Mayo, that's the secret. That's Got some eggs in here. Oh, there you go. Got to bind it. Yep. Old right, so that's the glue. We, once you mix that around, it looks yep. like this. So yeah. when you form your patties here, which bigger is always better, yes. um, huh. you want to put them back in the fridge for a couple hours, and that's going to help oh, them stay smart. together mm -hmm. on the grill. And we've we've got some over here that are grilling away. Good so, job, Mark. Looks great. Do they know, shrink up like do. a burger okay, does, or do they kind of maintain their size? They stay about the same size, because it's usually when fat renders out, that thing shrink, and these aren't, you know, the crab meat doesn't have a ton of fat in them. Mm -hmm. So, all right, we'll no show shrinkage. you guys how we build this. So, no Like a frightened turtle. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we have... 
All right, so we've got toasted bun. This is a potato bun. Uh, we do lettuce down on the bottom of the bun first because we don't want to get a soggy bun, so this actually protects the structural integrity of our BLT. Mm. So we go first down with that. Ooh, crab Whoa. cake down. <laughs> we go, look at this, nice grilled crab cake. And then we do tomato now. Everybody's favorite part. Mm. Oh, that looks good. Awesome. We do some bacon. Oh, mm -hmm. bacon. Oh. Now we're gonna do, so this Old Bay mayo is just mayo, Old Bay, and some lemon juice. Yes, it is. So we're gonna spread some of that on the top. That's special sauce. Delicious. Yeah. And yeah. then? Well, that looks amazing. Right, we gotta make sure we, we leave it equal is. time for Kansas City. Okay, looks real right. good. You got it. We need the KC time now. Thanks right. very much, Mark, for playing. It's a lot like <laughs> second place to me. All right. We're going to go ahead and start. We're going to do a Kansas City strip today, bruschetta. So we're going to up the bruschetta game. I mean, if you're tailgating and you're bringing this dish, people that actually might be in for that team might actually join KC. This is a real deal. <laughs> Not going to happen. It's going to happen. All right, this is an American Wagyu steak. This is a strip steak. We're going to take a little kosher salt. Now, what's great about this, this is a pretty big, this is like a two-inch cut of steak here. You can salt pretty liberally, all right? Is that a New York strip or a Kansas City strip? Sure is, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> actually, it's both of those things. <laughs> kind of the same cut. <laughs> all right, so we're going to take this, and we're going to throw this on our charcoal grill that we've got going here. All we're going to do is we're going to put this on an indirect side. We set up the grill for two-zone cooking. Mm. We want this side for searing, and we want this side for indirect, all right? So then what you're going to get, the magic of TV. Charcoal, by the way. You get this beautiful steak, steak yeah. that appears. Green egg. So we're going to take you. this off at about 132 degrees or so, and then we're gonna sear it so it gets these beautiful, this beautiful color, this beautiful char, and then we're gonna cut this up, all right, and I'll show you that in a sec. Man, let's make some bruschetta, all right? Roma tomatoes, love them, you can find them anywhere. I'm from Ohio originally, man, if there's a tomato aisle, it's full of Romas, which is great, because <laughs> they're easy to find. So we use Roma tomatoes, we're gonna use a little chiffonade basil, it's a very fancy way of cutting it, which I always do, right, Mark? Someone else did that for you. I know. It doesn't matter. All right. Chili <laughs> Calabri and chilies we have here as well. Mm. <laughs> and we have some champagne vinegar. Mm. All right. We do a little Fancy. salt and pepper in here as well, which I love. All right. And that makes our bruschetta. All right. Very That's simple easy. dish to make, but super fun. And it, again, looks like this. You give this a stir. Uh -huh. Really fun stuff. Where's so I'm going to show you how to really quickly. What's that? Yeah, the steak comes in really quickly. I'm going to show you this. All right. This is what you get. Okay. Oh, we got okay, the okay. magic of Hollywood again. Oh. Oh. All right, so what we like to do is toast the baguette with a little mm. olive oil, and we like to smash, we like to smash the garlic, okay? And then what you do is you rub it oh. right when the bread comes off the grill yum, yum, with yum. the garlic. Mm. So you're getting this really beautiful kind of raw flavor as well. And then we're going to, no, Mark, Mark, <laughs> not yet. <okay? laughs> then we're gonna take our bruschetta, and we're gonna build this, all right, put it right on here. And some beautiful pieces. I mean, guys, guys, guys. That that is is that's big. That's Medium steak. rare, about 135 degrees or so. And we're going to layer top. this steak beautifully on here. All right. And what I like to do, too, is take a little bit of Parmigiano Reggiano cheese. Mm -hmm. You take a vegetable peeler, just take the piece of cheese, cut it right off. Nice. Right on top. Right on top. Oh, that's amazing. Wow. Balsamic that's beautiful. Reduction. That's a pickle. Is it an open faced sandwich? A little bit of that. Like this is what yeah. you get, guys. Oh, gorgeous. Open. I'm going with the steak. I think I would go with the steak. I would go with the steak. It's a portable steak sandwich. It's a portable steak sandwich. Yeah. That's they both look great, guys. Oh, You've done it again. Come in the dads. studio, Grill Dads. We need to do this in yes. person yes, next please. time so we can eat that. Love it. Mark yeah, you and Ryan. need a real bite of this. Yeah. I know. we yeah. got to feed you guys on the plaza. Thanks, those guys. Those both look great. Guys, thank you so much. If you want those full recipes, awesome. go to today.com slash food. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts.
We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world, because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Touchdown. We are back with our tastiest segment of the week. We really do look forward every week to this yes. moment. Today, Food Loves Football. For Sunday night's battle on NBC, it's the Colts traveling to San Francisco to take on the Niners. And if you are in need of some delicious game day snack ideas, we got you covered. Katie Lee, cookbook author, co-host of the Kitchen on Food Network, uh, and an all-around great gal. Aww, good to have you. I'm so happy to be here. This feels so good. It's my first time back. Yeah. I know. It's a really wonderful. So Anything new you. in your life? I had a baby. Yeah. yeah she's 13 months old wow. now. I oh can't gosh. believe it went by like that, like everybody says. Yeah. But we're having such a good time. A so pandemic baby. That's right. Yeah. Oh, I love it. It was a good time to have a baby. So what are we making? Are we doing 49? Right. First. Yes, we're doing 49ers first, okay. and we're going to have a clam chowder dip. Ooh. Yes. Yes, in a sourdough bread bowl, of yep. course. Double yes. Right? Yeah, very light recipe. Yes, that's <laughs> fine. That's not what, yeah, we eat on football Yeah, days. all right, so let's get moving here. Okay, We've got sour cream, cream cheese, white cheddar cheese. If you'll pour in Is this some creamed corn? Creamed corn, yep. I've seen that since the 70s. Okay. Right, and then we've got some uh, seafood seasoning, celery seed, and pepper. I am dumping so it. So you can mix all that in. What's this? And that's Worcestershire sauce. Okay. So that's just going to kind of rich in the way. flavors. The clams, are canned those just clams. out of a jar? Or They're those... canned clams. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I really like canned clams. Okay. I started using them a lot out of my pantry during yeah. the pandemic, and I love them. Love it. We've got red bell pepper mm -hmm. here, parsley. We've got Smelling some scallions. Good. We've got bacon. we got to have that. Mm -hmm. If you'll give that a good stir yes, for me, I've got the sourdough bread bowl here. Okay. Just cut the top off of it, and then you want to kind of hollow this out. Why? And save it, because that's what we're going to put the dip in. Oh. Now, are we going to bake this so that yes. this cheese melts? So yes, okay. it's going to get all ooey gooey, oh, yeah. melted, delicious. How am I doing? It's the worst I, mean, there. I think fit, well, football food, so you got to have melted cheese. Yeah. Yeah. Fair, so I feel like I need a couple of them. <laughs> It's no carb, you know, this yeah. is good. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. carb left this behind, right? Okay, so you tear tools. it out. Okay, okay. put that healthy. in there. The whole thing? Yes, the whole thing. Wow, okay. And then we're going to make a little topping Wait, with you know, oyster I... crackers because, you know, clam chowder. you oh, got to have some oyster crackers. And what is that? So Ooh. this is that seafood seasoning in oh. melted butter with some parsley. We're going to pour that in. And in the Savannah. seafood seasoning, Katie, yeah, can you just get it from the store? You'll take this and just brush it around. Oh, I'm brushing the bread. Yes, the bread's going to have it. You just get it. It's like, you know, seafood boil. Oh, that's good. It's good. Like you like oh, it? Oh, yeah. Are you yeah. talking like Old Bay, Katie? Is it what? Old Something bay. like Old Bay? Yeah, exactly. Oh, exactly. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, so then Old we're going to top right. this yeah. with the oyster crackers. Yeah. It's going into the oven. Oh, 350 I'm going to here, too. Sure, and so save that. You're really well with dipping. This. Oh, thank you. I know. I know. You're right doing now. great. I know. No one thought I could do it. She knows which side her bread's butter. <laughs> I believe in you. <laughs> All right, into the oven, 350 degrees for about 30 up. minutes. You can, no, you leave that off. You're oh. going to bake it just like that. Comes out like this. Yeah, good. Yum. Serve it with some potato chips with that extra bread mm -hmm. for some dippers. So San Francisco's done. Let's move on to Indianapolis. Indianapolis. Here's the thing. I ate bologna when I was a kid. Ooh. I didn't know bologna was bad. Oh, bologna never went bologna away. Bologna never in went away. Bologna is like the sleeper hit. Bologna. Everybody really loves it. And apparently it's a thing in Indiana. I oh. did some Googling. Oh. All right, so we're doing a bologna and cheese slider bake. These are those Yum. Hawaiian rolls. You oh, just yeah, slice it. it. Oh. Making a little sauce oh. here with oh. mayonnaise. What's that cheese? I don't know if I've ever mustard. seen that color cheese before. American, American cheese. cheese. It's American yes, cheese. But it looks a little like, I know what American <laughs> cheese is. It looks but, a different color. No? We've got pickle okay. relish. It looks like craft singles, by the way. That's easy to like. Well, you know, I think American cheese is such a good melting cheese. I like white American cheese. You ever try that? Yeah, you oh, yeah. that That's too. Good. Yep. And then just spread Wouldn't this onto either. all those rolls. Okay. You want me to spread it? Sure, Craig, you want to help Since me put the bologna yes. on here? So yes, and I you're do. just going to layer it. So you're doing a layer of American cheese and a layer of bologna. Do I overlap? Taste a little yeah, bit. Yeah, overlap it. It does have that yeah. mustardy. I always mm -hmm. loved fried bologna oh, sandwiches I love when I was a little girl. Oh, oh my gosh, gosh, me too. White bread with yellow mustard. Yeah, the way white they fry bread. up and That's they the get kind of bubbly. Right so okay. good. Well, they haven't yes. been invented whole wheat yet. I'm mustard. Word, bro? Straight mustard. Yeah. That's right. That's great. Guys, do you like the bologna That's sliders? Awesome. Yes. It, it almost you know tastes like a little mini Cuban sandwich. It has like that kind of Cuban sandwich feel to it. It's great. I can see that. Okay. And then we're going to put that on top, brush it with butter. You love the brushing. Yeah, why not? A little extra butter. 
This and is a messy Rana situation. Katie, we're out of time. Okay. Okay. Katie, who do you like in this game? The recipes <laughs> are on today.com. You want to break down the matchup for the Colts, Colts 49ers. Colts 49ers, Sunday night, no? here on okay. NBC. Coverage starts at 7 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Have a nice weekend. Welcome to our Today All Day special, The Upside. I'm Craig Melvin. The Upside is all about uplifting people and stories that show the true grit of the human spirit. And after spending an amazing two weeks at the Tokyo Olympics, we couldn't help but think about the power of sports. So today we're going to shine a light on how sports changes lives, helping folks overcome obstacles both on and off the field. Now, traditionally, the sport of rowing isn't known for its diversity. While talent is everywhere, access is not. But that didn't stop the students of St. Benedict's Prep in Newark, New Jersey. With the help of a dedicated coach, they changed all that. And as you'll see, the school has a, a bit of a habit of turning tradition on its head. Spending a day at St. Benedict's Prep in Newark, New Jersey will leave you nothing short of inspired. You're a winner. You're a winner. Go. Don't miss. The moment. Heart and hustle are everywhere. Thanks on three. One, two, three. Bang. On campus and four and a half miles off. Yes, you know, that's what I want. On the Passaic River. You know, you're making a change if it feels uncomfortable. That's where you'll find Coach Craig White. I graduated from St. Benedict's. I live in Newark. I've lived in Newark my whole life. Ugh. What makes St. Benedict's Prep different is everything. And he's not kidding. The students take charge here. So when one asked him to start a crew team, he had no choice but to take it up with the headmaster, Father Leahy. And I told him, I said, no, a crew's too expensive, Greg. We can't do crew. One day I was walking around the property, walked through a door and tripped over an erg. So I called Craig. I said, Craig, what the heck is the erg doing here? Oh, somebody just gave it to me. Gave up some story, right? Ergs kept multiplying. And then one day I look across my room in the monastery, just thinking, eight-man shell. Craig, he just ignored me. So now we have a, you're here doing a story on the crew team. What started as a leap of faith is now a 10-year success story. We're consistently getting higher and higher and higher and higher up the rankings. Our kids this year, they advanced to the semifinals at Stotesbury Cup for the first time in a decade. I never really imagined that I could be a part of something so big. When I got to the team, I was just like surprised that, wow, this actually exists. And like, it was really one of the first things that I, I could dedicate myself to. That dedication got Yamil, Jaden, and Alvaro a ticket to U.S. Rowing's Olympic Development Program. And now, they're dreaming bigger than they could have ever imagined. My dream one day is to make the Olympics. I would love to go to the Olympics. My dream is to make the Olympics. If one of my kids is on the Olympics, I'm probably going to break the television. You know, screaming and throwing stuff, but it's, it's great. Do we have a future Olympian in this group? Yes. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. While gold medals would be nice, Coach White says it's the character building on and off the water where the real magic happens. Every time I have to do something hard, I like think about it. Like, I've been on the erg for like 90 minutes straight before. I just think about that and be like, okay, I can do this. If I can do that, if I can do 90 minutes on the erg, I can definitely do this. What we do on the water every day, without question, changes lives. When the kids come to us and they're a part of the team, they change for a couple of reasons. One, first off, they learn and they understand that I have power to make my life better. It's not just about the sport. 
you know? It's about, am I making myself better? Uh, not just interpersonally, but am I becoming a better athlete? Holistically, better. Is my technique improving? Are my grades improving? Is my relationship with my family improving? And every generation of kids, every year, they raise the bar and they do that themselves. But they'll tell you, none of this would be possible without Coach White. He's like the guy. You know? He's just the guy. He's he, just he, a guy. He does, a, he does a lot for us. He sacrifices a lot for He's us. Like a, he's kind of like a second father to me. These kids, these kids are so grateful for everything. They're grateful for each other. They're grateful for the experience. And you could literally ask them to move move mountains, and they'll do it. From changing lives to changing the world of rowing, to recognize the value of diversity in the sport, Coach says he's just getting started. The rowing community in our country in particular struggles. Um, it struggles to be able to diversify the sport. You know, our kids get hooked the minute that they get in the boat. So all we have to do is to provide access, you know, open a door. And then once the kids walk through it, they want to do it every day. I want these kids to have whatever they want. I want them to be able to grow into the world. They have the grit, they have the intelligence, they have the work ethic. So to be able to share myself and my family and my time with these kids, to be able to watch them grow, to be able to do what was done for me to another generation of, 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 of young people, What else is there, you know? The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? The Sunday Sit Down with Willie Geist podcast. It's the conversations you want to have with the people you'd love to meet. Get your money's worth. Unedited, unfiltered. See ya! Sit down with Willie and listen wherever you get your podcasts. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Skateboarding made its Olympic debut this year, but it's a 46-year-old newcomer and mom of two who has everyone talking, known by her alter ego, Auntie Skates, or B. Roy's uplifting and inspiring skating videos have gone viral on TikTok, proving she's not your average auntie. When I get on a skateboard, it is the most liberating feeling I've ever experienced. And whatever problems that I'm having in my life, they just go away. Yay! <laughs> And when I get in a, in a sari and I start flying in the bowl, it's just really fun. I feel very lucky that I found skateboarding. I could have lived my whole life and never found it. Meet Orby Roy, also known as Auntie Skates on social media. She's a 46-year-old mother of two who started to skateboard just three years ago. When I started skateboarding as a family, I started an Instagram account just to track our progress for fun and feel good about us as a family skateboarding together, and it made me really happy. Then in January of 2021, it was a particularly dark period for, I think, a lot of people with COVID, and everybody just seemed depressed. People weren't even hiding it anymore, and myself included. I think that, that mental health, everybody's mental health was suffering. So I created Auntie Skates as a way to spread joy and positivity. I started a TikTok account. I had never even been on TikTok before. 
and I took a character, Auntie, and I just started posting really fun, uplifting videos. I had created the character Auntie some time ago in improv, and I may or may not have been disciplining my children with that accent. Hello everybody, it's Auntie. I'm out in the cold weather in Canada to do a rock to fakey. First try, ready? That was one piece of it. And the other piece of it was, I, I was getting on Instagram more and I started following young South Asian women and I started to notice that they were complaining often about auntie. And every culture has that toxic person in their lives, the person that tries to bring them down, the, the person that's always judging them, you know, the person that says, why aren't you married yet? And every culture has that, my culture included. So why not be the person that builds people up? And that's why Auntie Skates was created, specifically. And it wasn't just her age that made her stand out in the skate park. As a South Asian woman, I do wear traditional dress often for special occasions, weddings. Any chance I can to wear a sari, I will wear it. A sari is a traditional Indian outfit that women wear, and it's a long piece of cloth that you wrap around yourself. It comes in really bright, vibrant colors. I like to have fun as a skateboarder. I like to have fun as a mom. And I took Auntie Skates a little bit further, and I put Auntie in a sari, and I skated the bowl. Orby didn't realize the impact that she would have on others. It was the comments that people were leaving from the 40-year-old man who used to skate as a kid and bought a board because of me, to the young Indian girl in, in, in a village in India who said, if you can do it, I can do it. It resonated with so many people in so many different ways. Roy was always someone that took risks, even when she was a young girl. My parents are immigrants. They came to this country in the 60s. And I think when they came to this country, they had culture shock. They didn't really feel comfortable raising a daughter in a new, more liberal country. And I think what happened was they kind of doubled down on their old school values. They were doing what they thought was best for me. And they were setting some standards based on their own fears. and. The great thing about my parents is that they learned from their mistakes. Yes, I got a computer science degree. Yes, I worked on Wall Street. But that day that I called my father and told him I was walking away from this job and he supported me and my mom supported me, I knew that I would always have my parents' support no matter what crazy thing I did. And with Auntie Skates, the fact that I was doing skateboarding in the first place. They were behind me immediately. Sadly, Roy lost her beloved father, Shamit, this year. I've always leapt before I looked, and the reason why I've been able to do that is because of my father's support. He always had my back, and he would gently guide me. Family support has always guided Roy, and it was her husband, and ultimately becoming a mother that made her want to pick up a skateboard and try. When I first started talking to Sanjeev, skateboarding came up right away. He told me he sprained his ankle skateboarding and he couldn't come and meet me and that I should come and meet him. And I immediately asked him, are you a pro skater? I had no concept of adult skateboarding. And he said, I'm not a pro skater, I'm an adult skateboarder, I just like to skateboard. She just fell in love with it. Next thing you know, I get a text message of her dropping in on a quarter pipe and um, <laughs> I, and, and like falling on her butt and laughing. And yeah, I think that was it, that hooked you. When we're sessioning, which is a bunch of us skating together, we just feed off of each other's energy and we push each other to try new tricks. We celebrate together. And we also, we also push each other a little bit, why not? Roy believes skateboarding has actually made her a better parent. There's a lot of life lessons to be learned in skateboarding. I've watched my kids' confidence grow so much as they skateboard. And they also learn a little bit about perseverance. You're not going to get something right away. It's not gonna be handed to you. Sometimes I'm mad, sometimes I'm frustrated. Mama, you say I'm the drama queen. I am the drama queen. They see all the emotions that I go through and they see me get through it. 
And that's what they're, they're mimicking that behavior now. Sometimes people are at the skate park and they're a little bit nervous. And I always go to those people and say, you know, say, how are you doing? Do you need some help? And now they do the same thing too. And I just, I, it, just the fact that they have compassion and empathy and that they've learned that, it, it makes me so proud. It makes me so proud. That's parenting 101, I guess. People ask her, are your kids embarrassed of you starting this thing? And we're, and we're, we're not, we're not. We're like, we're really proud of her. Like, there's no reason to be embarrassed. Like, if you have, like, a super cool parent or a super cool mom, be proud of it. <laughs> As a 46-year-old woman who gets into a bowl and skates in a sari, I want people to know that you can do anything you want. Be kind to yourself and follow those dreams. Do that thing you thought was too late to do. Do the thing that makes you happy. Auntie believes in you. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life this is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? I believe, I believe. Every dream, every journey, every triumph. And it all starts here. Let the celebration begin! The excitement is in the air. The United States wins the Is he superhuman? Feel the magic every day. She is a superstar. Uh, Kayla, we are cheering <laughs> you are. on. Sean White! And share every moment with us at the Winter Olympics. Today. Today. Today, Today. Today is where the games begin. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Turning obstacles into opportunities might seem daunting for some, but not for weightlifter Chris Rudin, who has dedicated his life to teaching others how to live without limitations. A lot of people know that I'm, I was born with a disability, but a lot of people don't know the story behind the glove and why I've kept it on for so long. I started wearing this glove in middle school. I was used to the looks, but it wasn't until I went to middle school that kids started making fun of me. So this is the first time I am taking my glove off in front of people. I've hidden from everyone else and myself. And I can't anymore. I really can't. I remember making that video, uploaded it to YouTube, I closed my laptop, and I just didn't look at it. I was like, I don't care what happens, I'm just, I'm just gonna avoid it. And I woke up to being on the front page of YouTube, on the front page of Reddit, and all over the internet. Washington Post picked it up and just everyone ran with it. This is me. It's a part of me. It's something I have to learn to fully accept. And I guess you do too. My name is Chris Rudin, and I was born with two fingers on my left hand and a shorter left arm. I never even thought that there was other people like me. I accepted that I was different. And for a long time, I accepted that I was broken. I accepted that I was less than. I always told myself that I never needed to stop hiding to the point where I wouldn't leave my house if I couldn't find my glove. I've had to even text my dad. I'm like, hey, I need a glove. And he would go to the store to get me one because I wouldn't leave the house. I refuse. 
but I set a goal if I ever got a prosthetic arm, which is almost impossible to get, that I would take my glove off and I would show the world. Since my last post, I have been invited to be on a TV show hosted by The Rock. I never thought I would take my glove off and show people my disability. I'm here for every kid that's afraid of being different. Every kid that's afraid of the way they look or the way they are. I'm here to show that it's possible. And I hope every kid in America knows limitations are self-imposed. Great job. Thank you. To look back and go from the kid who was hiding, the kid who was ashamed to be in front of everyone, to being on magazine covers, being on billboards with The Rock, a guy who used to play with his action figures and speaking all around the world, making a book, breaking a world record and deadlifting over 650 pounds with one hand against non-disabled people. All of that is amazing, but every day I get to help someone have that light bulb moment of, hey, I'm more than my circumstance is the best feeling in the world. Super early this morning, but it's time to head to Nubability. Nubability is a nonprofit organization that teaches kids with limb differences how to play organized sports. I'm really excited to meet the kids, to see how the camp is. I never really had any of this growing up, so it'll be fun. How you doing? This is my first year as a coach at Nubability. When you think of the word overcomer, it's every single person in this room. What I really love about Nubability is there's archery, fishing, basketball, football, every sport you could imagine, even lifting weights. But more than just the sports, it's the opportunity to overcome any obstacle that this limb difference or amputation might present. Snag it. Oh, that's all right, that's all right, man. Good hustle. Go, 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 go. Oh my God, I'm so glad I got to see you. Are you fishing? Yes. Yeah. Bonding with the next generation makes me feel impactful. It makes me feel like I'm serving some sort of higher purpose beyond the struggle that I have, but the struggles that everyone else faces. You can reel up the line a little bit. Come on, you gotta know we're gonna catch fish. Mr. Chris is awesome, kind, sweet, nice to others. Mr. Chris is one of my most favorite people in the world. Got it. Reel it in. And the most Funnest one I've ever met. Boom! Boom! That's a catfish. Good job. One more time. All the way down. Chest up, knees out. Up! Good job. Good job. I'm stretching. I was teaching kids strength and conditioning, but what I was really teaching them is unwavering confidence. Up! The ability to be resilient and the ability to adapt for any circumstance most fulfilling moment today was definitely watching this guy who was definitely taken aback by like everything. He deadlifted for the first time in his life and he was emotional. He was definitely emotional. And it, it got me to watch a kid go from being timid to confident. You just did four different workouts in two seconds. That was cool. I love that light bulb moment that took me 17 years to happen. It takes them a few minutes. Look at you doing pull-ups. It's important not to hide who you are because in hiding, you'll never discover who you actually are. All you will be is a carbon copy of everyone else and the world has enough other people and the world doesn't have any of you. Good job. So why rob the world and the next generation of the potential and the reach and the impact that you can be? By being yourself. Being seen makes me feel like a person who's not broken. And the biggest moment of feeling seen was when I looked at my mirror and I wasn't ashamed of what I saw anymore. The upside to my story is regardless of what life throws at you, there's always a way to make it to the top. journey, every triumph. And it all starts here. Let the celebration begin! The excitement is in the air. The 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 which the is he superhuman? Feel the magic every day. She is a superstar. <laughs> Kayla, we are cheering <laughs> you on. And share every moment with us at the Winter Olympics. Today, today, today. Today, today is where the games begin. That's 
Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts. In the city of angels, two kindly old ladies wanted to help homeless men get off the streets forever. And so they did. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, the new podcast from Dateline and Keith Morrison. Today on The Upside, we're shining a light on the ways sports uplift and inspire. Up next, we're going to introduce you to a young boxer who's doing just that, fighting to claim a place for women in a sport still dominated by men. I didn't think when I had started boxing that I was going to come this far. I didn't know I was going to grow this fast. This is Violet, the warrior princess Lopez. I would probably say I'm more of a warrior than a princess. A 13-year-old boxer from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who's shaking up the world of youth boxing. People say boxing is not meant for girls. I want them to see me as someone who shows you that you can do the sport you love even though it's a sport that people say is not meant for you. Violet was born with the heart of a fighter. She's our youngest female boxer ever to compete out of the United Community Center. And I taught her from scratch, you know, from a kid that didn't know nothing. One day I was at home and my dad came home from work and he was like, your cousins are gonna do boxing, do you wanna try it to see if you like it? They looked around, they trained a little bit, and then as the weeks went on, she just got more and more into it. At just eight years old, Violet won her first fight. She was forced to wait two years for her next fight because there wasn't another female competitor in her age group. Early on in her career, she was always down on herself because she never knew when she was going to get a fight. Being a female in boxing and then being an eight-year-old female, there's not many eight-year-old females that want to get punched in the face. For two years, she just trained. They would have show fights here and all the boys are fighting, but she wasn't. She was just watching from the stands. She started to kind of think if it was for her because she didn't feel like there was enough room for females in boxing just because there was no opportunities for them. I think that she realizes now that it's just part of the sport for female boxers. That's the last round, okay? 20 seconds. Not being able to get a fight and her crying because she wanted to fight. That's just as bad as losing. But Violet didn't let that stop her. By 12 years old, she was the top-ranked amateur boxer in the country in her division, winning gold at the Junior Olympics and five national championships. I want everyone to know that I worked really hard to get to where I am right now, and it's not always easy. One of Violet's biggest challenges is outside the ring, fighting the stereotypes that are familiar to many female athletes. Their biggest challenge is the fact that they are a female and not a male. People just assuming that they have it easier, people thinking that the training may be different for them, not as hard, they don't have to do as much. To see her cry in her bedroom, to say that my daughter wouldn't have national championships if she were a boy because it'd be so much harder and like that's real boxing is just crap. <laughs> Nonetheless, Violet persists. Leading up to Lake Charles, I thought we had a really good camp. You know, she knew she had to step it up and she had to fight harder, prepare harder. Violet persevered, she, she outboxed them, she did what she had to do. I'm really happy. I'm glad that I got another win in my book. Violet was poised to have her best season ever in 2020. 2020 was going to be the year like that. I just skyrocketed. But no, the coronavirus came along. It impacted me so much. I had to take off a year of showing people what I can do and who I want to be and what I want to change for boxing. Violet's gym closed in March of 2020 and she had three of her upcoming tournaments canceled because of the pandemic. Her next national tournament was set for March 2021. I'm looking forward to fighting because I haven't fought in all. It's going to be a whole year once that time comes. Not having fought in a while, it is going to be a little more difficult because I'm going to have to like get back into the groove of things. I just always tell her to continue to be her and work as hard as she can, and that'll, 
that'll just be enough to always know what you want, continue to be who you are, and just do the best that you can. We can't always expect you to win and be perfect. Violet finished third in the Youth National Championships. After that one loss, Violet's national ranking dropped from first to third. I think I needed that loss. That was my first loss in a long time. I gotta work harder because I wanna get back to the number one spot because that's where I should be. I'm graduating eighth grade, so I'm gonna become a high schooler in a few months. My birthday is coming up too, so I'll be 14. I'm beyond proud. I'm beyond proud. I, there, I, there's not a word. For what we've accomplished and for what we've done together, I, I just don't feel like people can take that away from me. In July, Violet's home gym reopened and she earned a bronze medal at the 2021 Junior Olympics in Lubbock, Texas. Next up, she's aiming for that number one ranking. My goal is to get my number one spot back because that's what I want, period. <laughs> That's it for us on the upside. Power of sports. Hope you walk away inspired by the incredible people and stories that we showcased today, proving that you don't have to be an elite athlete to experience the life changing power of sports. When you're at the gate, ready to take off, is there something you do every time? Is there a. <laughs> Sometimes I have a song stuck in my head. For a lot of last season, it was that children's song on top of spaghetti. On top of spaghetti. <laughs> like, no, get out, get out, get out. <laughs> So what was it like to get back on skis for this season after, after obviously a very disruptive postseason? Well, <laughs> This season has been a lot more no closer to normal. So we always start in October and the 2020 year leading up to that October was so far away from the preparation we would normally look for. On snow, training in the courses, in the gates, that was totally different. We didn't, we didn't really have access to any on snow training until just before the first race. You know, we missed what would have otherwise been, you know, 40, 40 plus days of on snow training. That's, that's really important to be prepared for the competition season. But this time around, we've had a much more normal preparation period. We got our spring training camps. I got the, all of the hours in the gym that I was shooting to get and with my normal training equipment and all of those pieces that, that we had been lacking. I feel like I'm in a much better place and I think most of the athletes feel a lot closer to their, you know, normal level of preparation, which is, that's a big thing for your confidence. Stepping into the start gate and thinking, I, I at least sort of know what I'm doing. <laughs> well, you, there's such a thing as hitting a peak. Will you hit your peak at the, at the right point leading into Beijing? Well, that's always the question, isn't it? <laughs> I, there, there's, there's things we can do that help, um, help sort of determine where you hit your peak. And you can hit multiple peaks as well. But it's also very easy to go overboard, to, to be overtrained, over raced even, um, just in general overtired. And that, it's a very fine line between, um, getting the stimulus you need in order to actually peak several weeks later and getting too much stimulus and actually having it be very much a valley. But isn't it, isn't it a game like, like all sports of hitting your physical peak, but also yeah. your emotional and mental peak? Yeah. And are those, is, it, are, is it hard to align those? Yes. I think it probably it happens like one in a hundred times that any athlete tries. I mean, if you're physically in good shape, it's a little bit easier to feel more stable mentally. And then, you know, emotions often go along with that. So they do play off of each other a little bit, but it's highly unlikely that I'm going to feel great at the Olympics because it's the highest pressure situation we deal with. It's a highest stress. It's the most challenging logistically. It's far, far away from not only home, but any sort of sense of normalcy that we experience in ski racing because we never compete in China. So 
all of these, you know, you're throwing all of these different variables at all, all of the athletes. And uh, for, for me, I think that's probably gonna keep me on the edge of my seat a bit. And I'm going into the games expecting to feel uncomfortable, to be honest. And I guess the easy answer would be to shut out all the extraneous stuff, don't yeah. read the papers, don't read the blogs, but that's not real. You can't really do it. You can't really shut it all out. I mean, to be honest, when we're over there, we're not really seeing all of the coverage from back home and every single thing that people are saying. When we're over there and I'm just going through my daily routine, whether it's training on snow or getting in a gym session or just some physical therapy or whatever it is, like it's always in the back of my mind. People, everybody back home is watching and you can feel that sort of, it's like a buzz or a hum in the air. You can feel that energy. And sometimes it can be something that really drives you forward. And sometimes it feels like a weight on your shoulders. And I think, I don't know, it just depends on what side of the bed you wake up in the morning. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? I believe, I believe. Every dream, journey, and triumph. And it all starts here. United States! Feel the magic every day. The excitement is in the air. At the Winter Olympics, today is where the games begin. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You've had success in two previous Olympics. Is there a part of you that says, I've got to come back with more medals? That's the expectation? Yeah. I, I would say that's a fair expectation. But I... It doesn't go beyond that. It, I mean, it's a goal. That's a dream. I, I want to... I want to compete in as many events as I possibly can um, at the games. And of course, I'm going to be racing for gold. And to me, that is what every athlete's doing. So it's not, it's not actually saying in really much of anything. It's just we're all there and we all want to win. So, you know, we're really in the same boat. So it really, for me, it boils down to how I actually ski and what I do in every hour and every minute leading up to the games and at the actual games, everything that I do that allows me to ski at my highest capacity or let the pressure be too heavy. And that, that's something I maybe have a little bit of control over. The chances are that you feel stressed when the stress is high. You know, I think that's with anything in life when it's really hectic and stressful and chaotic and there's pressure and you're expected to win and and you're expected to to be sort of invincible, that's when you, that's when the armor cracks. So I kind of, I'm just like going in and like, well, I'm just gonna take off the armor now because it's not gonna do me any good. And so where's the fun in all for this? It. Where, where do you find it? You know break? what, the fun in it is when I ski well and I make really good turns, that's not a feeling you get doing anything else in life. You don't, it's like flying without a plane. Like you feel so connected to the energy that you can build with your skis on the surf, on the snow, on the mountain. And it feels like you're just, I don't know, dancing or flying or something. It just makes you feel so good that everything else is worth it. But it's hard to remember how good that feels when you're thinking about winning and gold and pressure and expectations and all of the weight and everything that I have to do and this and that. 
And that's, it's like that, there's that bucket, and then there's a bucket of how I, am I actually skiing, and is that fun to do? And so far in my career, the answer has always been yes to that question, so everything else is worth it. Is there a mantra when you're, when you're at the gate, ready to take off? Is there something you do every time? Is there a... <laughs> I don't have a specific routine. Most of the time, you know, I'll do, I'll focus on my breathing, or I will focus on the first gate of the course when I'm standing in the start gate, and I'll try to really zone in hard on the first gate of the course and like let everything else blur out. Or sometimes I have a song stuck in my head. For a lot of last season, it was that children's song on top of spaghetti. And it's actually been pretty much stuck in my head for the last year and a half, so that's super annoying. <laughs> That's as you're at the gate? Yeah, just like, <laughs> on top of the gate. <laughs> like, no, get out, get out, get out. I am never going to be able to watch you now without thinking about that as you head down the mountain. I hope that you have it stuck in your head as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so are you as good as you're going to be? Or, I mean, how much potential do you have, I guess, is a better way to ask the question. That's, hmm. Because you're pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I hope I have more potential. I know I have faster skiing. Like when I, every single day I go out and train, I figure something out. I get faster in some way. I, I find a, a faster line around the gate or a more connected way to make the turn that, you know, accelerates out of the turn faster. There's, there's always something. And there's so many variables in skiing it's hard to say, like, what's your full potential? You know, how fast can you run? How fast can you make it down this hill? Because every single course and hill and mountain and snow condition is different. But I don't feel like I've hit my peak. It's just, I don't know, it's, it's how much is my ability to, to ski at that speed. Like, I can understand how to go faster in my mind, but can I actually do it? I don't know. Are you I skiing we'll in your see. head most yeah. of the time? Yeah, I ski in my head a lot. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's fun. Being able to, I mean, when walking around the city and just for a second you zone out of where you are and I'm all of a sudden I'm on the mountain making GS turns or in a slalom course or something. And I'm, it's just like an out of body experience or something. But that's something, thinking about skiing calms me down a lot. So if I'm in other stressful situations, I will often think about, I don't know, skiing, turning. And that's a very peaceful feeling. Michaela Schifrin was an obvious danger. She returned to form here, though, and skied into first position. Do you think fans and, and casual Olympic watchers like myself really get it as how hard what you guys do is? and how dangerous it is. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> um, I mean, we, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, I, I watch her. God, I hope she comes back with a medal. She's yeah. supposed to come back with a medal, and, and she makes it look easy. I'm saying all the things Thank I know. Thank you. That, no, but... that's really nice. And I, you probably don't get it because I don't even get it all, all the time. You know, you, you don't get it until you're in a really scary situation where you actually get injured or you're very, you have a very close call. And you walk away from it and you think, wow, I, I'm really lucky that I didn't just break my leg or like literally ski through the fence and off the mountain or whatever hit that tree. I don't know. Like there's these close calls you have that you think, oh my gosh, <sighs> I'm still alive. Okay, all good. And it's not that it happens all the time. It just happens every now and then and normally for me it happens right when i'm starting to feel like that little bit of invincibility i'm thinking oh wow i'm really skiing well i feel great i'm whatever i'm just totally in touch with my skis and i feel powerful and all the all the great things that build you up and then something funky happens you hit just a small little chunk of ice in the snow and it grabs your ski in the wrong direction and you do the splits and you're like Oh my gosh, this is this is not a sport that it's I. Basically, truly... a guess what? I'm mortal. Yeah, exactly. Moment. And you have those mo moments all the time, but.
those are moments that people watching don't necessarily see, to be wow. honest. You are tremendous to watch. You're, you're so, <laughs> so impressive, and I really appreciate you taking time and chatting with us today. <laughs> Thanks. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. In the city of angels, two kindly old ladies wanted to help homeless men get off the streets forever. And so they did. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, the new podcast from Dateline and Keith Morrison. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon. And by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it what's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. In the city of angels, two kindly old ladies wanted to help homeless men get off the streets forever. And so they did. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, the new podcast from Dateline and Keith Morrison. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Kim spins, twirls, and flips her way to the top of the half pipe podium, becoming the youngest female snowboarder to ever win gold. I can't believe it's been four years. I know. Since I last saw you. Yeah. <laughs> I just looked back at some of the footage from your run in 2018. You look so different. Yeah. You've changed so much. Eyelash extensions. <laughs> How are you feeling heading back to the Olympics? I'm excited. I think it'll be really fun. I haven't been to that part of China. I heard it's really beautiful, so I'm excited. Did you ever consider not going back for a second Olympics? Definitely did. My first one was really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I was not expecting that kind of response. Unbelievable performance by a 17-year-old from Torrance, California, Chloe Kim, with all the pressure, all the hype, all the buildup. Believe the hype. It was really cool, for sure, but it definitely got overwhelming. Like, everything I knew was gone. <laughs> Suddenly you were everywhere. You were famous, you were on cereal boxes. Exactly, and it was just such a weird concept to wrap my head around, because I never saw that being me. So then I like kind of got scared. I got really bad anxiety, and I was like, okay, maybe I can't do that again, because I just don't know if I can handle it, but that's why I went to school. And that really gave me a good reset, like I needed that. How was <laughs> it to just go from the heights of Olympic glory to being just another college student. It was really fun. It was kind of weird at first. I think I was super closed off. The minute I stepped onto campus, people were running up to me asking me for photos and autographs, and I was like, no, like, I I just want to be a student. Like, I don't want to be Chloe Kim the snowboarder. I just want to be, like, a student. You weren't the regular college student you yeah. wanted to be at first. Yeah, at first. And then after a while, it kind of blew over. It was definitely a little stressful at first. Like, I couldn't even go to the dining halls because people were, like, taking pictures of me, and it was just, like, anxiety-inducing. Like, that was why I left snowboarding, was because I was already dealing with that, and I was just so disappointed that it happened the minute I went to school for, like, a reset. But you found a great group of friends. Yeah. Who kind of didn't know you were such a big deal. Yeah, exactly. All my really close friends had no idea who I was. We see you, you were such a force at the Olympics. The whole world fell in love with you. <laughs> and you have this big, darling, cute personality. But I can see how that would also create pressure 
to always be that version of yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, like, I'm when I'm happy, I'm really, really happy. And I think I was so happy the whole time I was at the Olympics that, and like leading up to it too, everything was so new to me. So I was like always on, always super excited. And then after a while, I was like, oh my God, people expect me to be like that all the time. But I definitely put a lot of pressure on myself for a couple years to just be that person, even when I didn't feel like it. Hard to keep that up though. Oh yeah, no way. My cheeks were hurting so bad from fake smiling. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah, it hurts. <laughs> it's sore. How did it affect your relationship with snowboarding? Because here's something you grew up with, you loved, you were a kid, you did it for fun. Yeah. It takes on a different dimension yeah. when you're an Olympic gold medalist. I think, honestly, I think I hated it for the first time, like in my life, hmm. post-Olympics. Because that's like all I was known for at that point. And like, that's fine. Like, I'm a snowboarder, I won the Olympics in snowboarding, but like, Everyone just knew me for like snowboarding and like expected me to always win at snowboarding events because I won the Olympics and like it was always about snowboarding in my career and I still find that happening it just bugs me. Of course, because you're more than a sport. Right, exactly. What do you wish people saw about you or knew about you? I don't know, like maybe ask me how my day was. <laughs> Even with my family, sometimes I'm like, I can't talk about snowboarding right now. Like, I don't want to. And that's that. <laughs> it's, it's enormous. First of all, just the crash after the Olympics yeah. is a lot to deal with. Yeah. How did you find your way back to snowboarding, to the, just the sport you loved? Living in a dorm for however many months did it for me. I mean, I loved going to school, but I just told myself if I missed it while I was at school, I would go back. And if I didn't, then I would just stay. And I ended up really missing it. I missed traveling, I missed my friends, I missed like my team. I came back and I love it. I'm like back to loving it. I feel really, really good. And now I've learned how to create boundaries with people. So I feel like before I would kind of just go with it, didn't want to cause conflict or anything, but now I'll just like set my boundaries and move on. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? For breaking news in our changing world, Download the NBC News app. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it, I know that it can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. Chloe Kim is the future and it is here inspiring women all over the world. And what's it like getting ready for another Olympics? Are you working on new tricks? <laughs> new you got a new plan? Yeah, I've learned three new tricks. So <laughs> I'm really excited. I'm hoping to put them all in a run at the Olympics. It's exciting. I mean now I'm doing like a bunch of interviews again, doing a bunch of shoots again. I haven't seen the uniforms yet, but I'm excited to see those. <laughs> I saw the closing ceremony and they're very cute. Really? The coat is cute. Yes, it's like a puffer coat. I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> we'll I think see. you'll like it. I think you'll wear it well. I hope so. <laughs> one of the images, that one of the things that people really remember from the 2018 Olympics is your adorable and enthusiastic family just cheering for you there. <laughs> they won't be able to come though this year to mm -hmm. Beijing. How do you feel about, you know, not having your that support system there? I think it'll be weird. <laughs> 
I'm so used to having like my family at the bottom of the pipe at almost every competition, so it'll be weird not having them there, but this is where I start growing up and start doing things without my family. Just feels like a lot of big steps, so I think this would be a good step too, and I feel like even though they're not there with me, I'm probably gonna call them a thousand times a day. I'm gonna call my dad if practice is stressing me out. He'll always be there for me. So I'm just so grateful that I just have such a supportive family. You know, it takes a village of people to help you to this point. So um, I'm just so grateful for everyone. We loved seeing your family, especially your dad <laughs> celebrate the gold. I saw a photo of my dad on Twitter with two beers in his hands, <laughs> just like drinking away. And I was like, oh my. So dad, like dad, you're embarrassing me in front of the world. <laughs> They're so thrilled for you. Yeah. We were talking about your sisters, their accountants. You had a different path since yeah. you were little. You grew up in Southern California. Yeah. Last I checked, there's not a lot of snow in Torrance, <laughs> California. How did this happen? I started when I was four at Mountain High. It's an hour away from LA. It's super, super close. The small one's coming. She's my daughter. That's kind of where it all started. My dad just wanted to take me and we tried it out and I picked it up really fast. I love how he gave up so much to help you achieve your dreams. Yeah. What does it mean to you? It means a lot to me. Um, I'm so grateful to have such a supportive family. As I'm getting older, I'm starting to realize that I'm very fortunate to have that and that not a lot of people have that because if it weren't for them, I definitely would not be here right now. It's really cool when your family supports you, like when you're everyone just all aboard, ready to go, ready to do it. It's hard to describe, but it adds a lot of comfort to my life. We kind of talked about the, the journey of like loving snowboarding when you're little, kind of being like, wait a minute, I'm not sure about this and loving it again. But if I ask you now, what do you love about your sport? <laughs> I think the thing I love the most about the sport is personally I get to push myself and I can set my own goals and work towards them and achieve them. It's the best feeling, whether it be like contests or tricks that I really want to do and never thought I could do them and being able to do them one day is a really good feeling. The other thing too is just the travel aspect of it. We get to go to some of the most beautiful places in the world and like I was in Sasve for a month. This little mountain town in Switzerland and it's just so beautiful just surrounded by mountains and every time it's just like unreal I just feel so fortunate to be able to go to these places and train there and just experience it with my friends and you know my boyfriend my family like it's great well as someone whose feet are firmly planted on the ground it also <laughs> looks like fun to fly and spin through the air. It is really, when it works out, it's super fun. <laughs> when you take it to the butt, it's not. <laughs> Crashing is less fun. It's not as fun to fall on your face. Well, when you're practicing and you're learning, you obviously fall a lot. Your dad had a, 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 a special <laughs> strategy for those falls. Yeah, my dad used to. <laughs> First of all, I would he would buy me like oversized pants, like when I was tiny like a woman's like adult woman's like medium pant and I was like what seven so you could imagine how that went but um he would cut up my mom's yoga mats <laughs> and make like little butt pads out of them so it just be, it'd be like super big obviously kind of like ice like hockey vibes um to cushion your falls to cushion my falls because he didn't know that they just sold butt pads like he thought that he was some genius. I mean, that was genius because he didn't know. Like, he did invent it, kind of. <laughs> that was probably like the first prototype for the first butt pad ever was exactly that. But, uh, you know, it was like 2010. So they had butt pads. I remember actually when we realized that they sold them was we were at a, like a sports store and they had butt pads and my dad was like... Could have been doing this the whole time. Because he would duct tape them to me. He would like duct tape the bottom to me and like he added a Velcro strap to the top, but like he needed to tape the rest of it down. It was a whole process. Please tell me there are pictures of this. I don't know if there are. <laughs> I feel like my mom was the one that documented everything. And that was one of those things where it didn't seem like cute at the time because like it was just like genius. Everyone was like, wow, like you're so smart. Like 
to my dad. Everyone was like, you're a genius. This is such a great idea. So no one thought to film it because they were like very inspired by it, I guess. They don't let you wear yoga mats inside your big pants at the Olympics, do they? No. So I mean, I'm sure they won't stop you, but... <laughs> Might throw off your balance. It's very uncomfortable, to say the least. I remember walking like stiff-legged everywhere because I couldn't bend my knee with them. <laughs> so That's it wouldn't cute. be good. And finally, I mean, you won gold in 2018. Do you feel pressure within yourself or from outside world to do it again? Yeah, I mean, winning another gold would be sick, but I don't really think that way. What do you expect for yourself or what do you hope for yourself? I just hope we all go, are all able to compete, make it there safely, just stay in one piece. <laughs> I think it's the goal, stay in one piece, land a good run and uh, yeah, come home to my family. I'm excited. I am not a good traveler, <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. <laughs> Big time change. Oh yeah. Yeah. I can't travel. It's hard. I've done it for so long and I, for some reason, can never find the things I need to find and I always barely make my flight. <laughs> but you got there when it counted. Exactly. So that's <laughs> why I'm hoping I just make it there. That's the first goal. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank it's you. great to see you again. Good to see you too. Yeah. Well, hello, hello to all of our friends watching Today All Day. This is Today in 30. We're pumped, guys. It's Friday. It's almost Super Bowl. We're ready. Oh, we are so yeah. ready. It's also another Winter Olympics weekend. Craig's going to have all the big headlines from the games just ahead, including Sean White's emotional mm. goodbye to the sport he helped push to new heights. Plus, we got to chat with and celebrate the snowboarding legend. He joined us here. Yeah, and we caught up with another snowboarding superstar, of course, Chloe Kim. She earned herself an historic repeat as Olympic champion. Another gold. That's all ahead. Plus, with the Super Bowl in mind, we're going to introduce you to an inspiring athlete whose persistence paid off and made his NFL dream come true. Let's get the show started. Let's wanna? do it. All right, it's time for Today, Today in 30. 30. Coming out of the Winter Games, Craig's right there, has everything we need to know. Hey, Craig, good morning. Hey, how are Savannah? Good to see both of you. Lots to get to this morning, including Sean White's emotional goodbye to the sport that he really helped push to new heights. Also, that bounce-back run from skiing great Michaela Schifrin. And also some overnight developments in the controversy surrounding Russian figure skating star Kamila Valieva, putting her participation for the rest of these games in some doubt. An urgent hearing will be held to determine if 15-year-old Russian skating sensation Kamila Valieva will be allowed to compete in the women's event. Valieva, who is a heavy favorite to win, became the first woman ever to land the quad jump in the Olympics, leading the Russian Olympic Committee to gold in the team event. Overnight, the international testing agency confirming a sample taken from the teenager at the Russian National Championships in St. Petersburg six weeks ago came back positive for banned substance, the Russian anti-doping agency suspended the skater, but lifted that suspension after Valieva challenged it, allowing her to compete in Beijing. Now, the ITA says it will appeal on behalf of the International Olympic Committee. The Russian Olympic Committee says Valieva has received negative results before and after the positive test, including in Beijing. Valieva still practicing. Meanwhile, on the halfpipe, a high-flying farewell for the ages. Three-time Olympic gold medalist Sean White ending his storied career. Here we go. Before his final event, White sending a message from the chairlift. What's going to happen is going to happen, and I'm, I'm excited about it. On his opening run, that excitement propelling White into the mix for another medal. It nails oh that. On run number two, White raising the bar in the half pipe like only he can. The competition's elder statesman unleashing an electrifying aerial display. And with one final drop in left, it was almost time to say goodbye. This run will mark the end of an era in snowboarding. Coming up just short of a medal, the five-time Olympian bidding farewell to the sport he redefined.
They line up to congratulate the GOAT. I'm so happy. I just want to thank everybody for watching. Um, That's okay. Everyone at home, thank you. Snowboarding, thank you. Soaking in the moment thank you. with his loved ones. I can't wait to see you all. <laughs> and on the slopes, a confidence boost for one of the greatest skiers of all time. Michaela Schifrin completing her run in the Super G. And it's great to see the smile on her face again. After two stunning early exits to start these games, the superstar turning her disappointment into fuel, taking a deep breath and racing down the course. Now is where she can separate herself. With a medal out of reach, Schifrin crossing the finish line, overcoming Olympic heartbreak, the face of her sport battling back. And for all the people who've been sending me support, I can only say thank you. And looking to defend their gold, Score! Team USA women's hockey advancing to the semifinals, beating the Czech Republic four to one. By the way, speaking of, of women's hockey there, since the sport was introduced in 1998 here at the Olympics, Team USA has made it to the finals, semifinals, every single game. Back to the figure skating controversy for a second as well here this morning. The World Anti-Doping Agency saying that it is also challenging the Russians' decision to reinstate Valieva, saying the Russian team did not apply the doping code correctly. The Russian side still has not explained that decision. And oh, by the way, it's still not clear if Russia is going to be stripped of gold in that team event, giving it to the Americans who won silver. So that's a controversy that we're going to continue to watch, guys. We'll be waiting for that one yeah, for the results of that. Thank you, Craig. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Sunday Sit Down with Willie Geist podcast. It's the conversations you want to have with the people you'd love to meet. Get your money's worth. Unedited, unfiltered. See ya. Sit down with Willie and listen wherever you get your podcasts. I believe, I believe. Every dream, journey, and triumph. And it all starts here. United States, let's go. Feel the magic every day. The excitement is in the air. At the Winter Olympics, today is where the games begin. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? Switch 900, the combos are insane. Switch backside 540, two incredibly difficult tricks and ending things with the 1080. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. That run right there, that is guaranteed gold. Uh, guaranteed gold, how right he was. We are back. We've got Chloe Kim's gold medal run uh, on the half pipe. It was pretty incredible. It really was. I mean, you could just like feel those screams no. all the way over here. Chloe showed us why she's the face of women's snowboarding, the big tricks, the height, the speed, all leading mm. to a massive score, unbeatable, and a historic repeat as Olympic champion. She's just 21 years old. We're delighted. We've waited patiently, and we've got <laughs> Chloe with us now live. Hey. Chloe, did you just know after that run, you were laying in the snow, the announcers knew it. Did you know you had gold in that moment? moment I didn't but I was so happy because I really struggled during practice and just landing my first run was just a huge relief I know um, you didn't so, yeah you <laughs> didn't show it because at the top of the um, <laughs> pipe there you were smiling yeah grinning. But then you said later like you were it, you had had a bad practice and you did not feel good going into it yeah 
Yeah, I always try to smile when I get really nervous. So that's my little sign. <laughs> I think it makes you feel better, but um, maybe it made me a little more nervous. I don't know, but I'm just so happy I landed. That's it. Well, like, I'm so happy I More did that. than landed. I remember the last Olympics. We remember you, you had your whole entire family there freaking out, biting their nails, watching. You got to see them again, but this one from afar. What was it like celebrating with them after that gold? Uh, it was so nice to talk to them and see their faces on FaceTime. Um, I mean, my Wi-Fi was a little bad, so it was kind of hard to tell like what they were saying, but I knew they were excited, and um, I just love talking to them. Oh, I love that video. I haven't seen that yet. Oh, oh my gosh, that's so cute. Oh, they're the cutest. Just, I guess cuteness yeah. has run strong in your family there, <laughs> Chloe. You know, we got to talk a couple weeks ago right before the Olympics, and you you kind of told me about this journey you were on with snowboarding, and mm -hmm. it was like with snowboarding and with fame and figuring that mm -hmm. all out, and it feels like you figured it mm -hmm. out just in time that you seem to have, you know, found a, a, your peace with where mm -hmm. you are and it really showed. Do you feel like that getting that mental stuff right and being in the right headspace made the difference? Well, I'm glad that you see that because I don't feel that way at all. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm constantly all over the place, mm -hmm. but I think just learning to accept that and go with it has been so helpful. I think it's a little unrealistic for me to expect to know, like, mm -hmm what's going on and like what to expect and like how I'm gonna feel when all of this is going down. So I've honestly just been taking everything with a positive attitude and doing my best to get through and it paid off. Well, it sure did. Uh, everyone's cheering you on. Your boyfriend was cheering you on. I'm sorry, I went to his in Instagram page. I was like, who is Chloe's cute? Boy yeah, we're friend. like, oh, he's cute. We're kind of into this relationship you guys have. What's it been like? Oh my gosh, I was actually laughing so hard on the way here because uh, my publicist sent me all the articles that were written about him and I was like, wow, Evan's having his moment right now. I'm so happy for him. <laughs> um, no, but he has been the best thing that's ever happened to me. Just so supportive, so loving. He actually took a quarter off of school, his winter quarter off of school to just support me on this journey. Just knew that I was going to be going through a lot and, you know, struggling a bit and dealing with a lot of pressure. And so he just put himself on hold to support me. And it's it's been amazing. Mm -hmm. So I'm so grateful for him and I can't wait to see him. Oh, that reunion's going to be sweet. Can we ask you about those last, you had, you had the gold medal run and everyone, everything was great. And then you had a couple of hard falls on the next two. Are you just, I just want to make sure, are you good? You're okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Um, I actually ended up kind of hitting my head a bit on the third run. Um, but I was like going, I had so much adrenaline. So I was like, yeah, this is great. Awesome. Like second gold medal. And then I got home and I was like, huh. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> Something feels a little off, but I'm all good now. Um, I just needed to sleep for like 15 hours. Okay. <laughs> We're all good. good. This is good. You got checked out. And you're, I mean, it's amazing because you really went for it, looking yeah. to advance the sport, which is so cool. Cool. And what does that mean to you? Yeah, it means a lot. I'm honestly pretty disappointed that I wasn't able to put it down because that's a trick that I thought I had on luck. I've landed it many, many times. And um, I just think maybe I got a little too excited to do it at the Olympics. Um, but I'm, I'm so happy I went out there and tried it and, you know, just attempted to continue to progress women's half pipe snowboarding. That's always the goal. So hopefully I could go back out there one day and land it in a run. Well, absolutely. Oh. By the way, Chloe, you were you made churros even more famous yeah. in 2018. Then we saw you looking for snacks at yeah, the press we conference. We love that. Do we need to like pack a granola bars for you and do like a care package if you go back to the Olympics? Mm, I know. No, this time I was responsible. I had breakfast. I learned my lesson from the last one. But um the thing is, I woke up at 6.20-ish because I had to get on the bus at 7. And so the last time I ate was at like 6.30. And by the time everything was over, it was about noon. So that's a pretty <laughs> good amount of time to not go with well, with yeah. food. Well, and Especially when you're getting so, a gold medal. Yeah, and Chloe, we, we, oh, yeah. we aren't Olympians, but we've got your jacket. Yeah, we're, we're so. flying the flag for you. We are. These are cool. Ah. These, are, these are official, huh? 
I love it. It looks so good on you. Thank, it's the closest we'll ever get, <laughs> exactly. but it feels good, Chloe. Wow. Thank you so uh, much. We are, we're so proud of you. Congrats. Thank you. I can't wait to give you guys a hug in person. Uh, us, too. us too, love. Us too. Us too. <laughs> See ya. Snowboarder Sean White, he was just a kid, a teenager, when he became the face of the halfpipe, winning his first of three gold medals in 2006. Well, last night, 16 years later, Sean took the final runs in his legendary career. Well, he came up just short of a medal, just short. He laid down some amazing tricks and showed the world once again why he is snowboarding's biggest star. And we're so delighted to have him with us now. Sean, good morning. Hi, Sean. Hey, good morning. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, Sean, I gotta tell you, I just love how much your heart was on your sleeve this entire Olympics. You really seem to be just soaking it in, enjoying it, reveling in it, and it was so emotional yeah. for you yesterday. Yeah, it was heavy. I mean, uh, I remember thinking that this day would come at some point in my life and career, and I pushed it off as far as I could. And, <laughs> And now to actually be living this moment was uh, really emotional and to see all my competitors here at the bottom, I mean, the kind words they had to share and um, the cheer of the crowd and to realize this is last time I'm doing this. It was pretty, pretty amazing. You know, sometimes you don't know how much you mean to so many people until the end comes like this, the end of your career. <laughs> Did you realize when you got this wave of support and love, people got into the sport because of you. They are imitating you. What did it mean to you? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a trip, obviously, to speak with some of the competitors, you know. Uh, one of the competitors uh, shared with me, he's like, you know, I've never told you this, but I used to ride your board when I first started, and I had your jacket that you always wore. <laughs> you know, and it was just like, you know, come here, man. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Thanks, you know? So emotional and, and so great to hear those words from everyone. And, you know, we kind of put the wall up because we're competing together but um, to hear that was just incredible and um, the, the messages I've been getting from people on my Instagram and the notes the text everything's just been so incredible and um, truly um, 20 years doing this and um, it's finally come to an end so it's, it's really really wild. Sean we'd seen that uh, TikTok earlier this week we reported that your girlfriend Nina had snuck in those photos of your friends and your family <laughs> into your luggage before you left for Beijing. Great moment last night when you were emotional during that interview yeah. and they showed the watch party yeah. of your family in Los Angeles. What was that like just to see their faces and have you talked to them since? Yeah, it was incredible. I mean, when they pulled them up at the event, I, I lost it. I couldn't control my emotions, you know. It, it really, you know, flooded back all those memories of my parents just getting up in the morning to drive to the mountains and um, every step of the way supporting me, my friends and people coming to watch and cheer me on. And um, so it was very emotional to not have everyone here. And, um, you know, like you mentioned, Nina had snuck some <laughs> pictures and things into my bag. I kept finding all these different pictures and uh, 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 letters from everyone cheering me on. And, and this was just an amazing moment. I, I couldn't control my emotions, but um, just the love from everyone. I can't wait to get home and see, see the fam and see the group and uh, especially Nina. Well, Sean, I mean, what can you say wow. about someone who's just a legend and a trailblazer <laughs> in the sport, done it all, and uh, we just add our congratulations and thanks yeah. for what a great ride, a great ride. Congrats, congratulations. congratulations, Sean. Thank you Looking so forward to your next much. chapter, yeah. too. Yeah, well, come see us on the <laughs> it's plaza. It's going to be great. All right. <laughs> no doubt. I would love to. All I would right, love right. to. Good. I'll hold well, you Sean. to it. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. 
for coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. The Sunday Sit Down with Willie Geist podcast. It's the conversations you want to have with the people you'd love to meet. Get your money's worth. Unedited, unfiltered. See ya. Sit down with Willie and listen wherever you get your podcasts. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. The U.S. figure skating team has uh, looked, looked sharp so far in Beijing, and this weekend they compete in the rhythm and dance events. And here with what to expect, Olympic gold medalist Meryl Davis, she and her skating partner, uh, Charlie White brought home gold in the Sochi. Meryl, good to have you. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. So nice to be with you. Mm -hmm. So we, we got a hint of what's to come during the team skate event earlier this week when Team USA nabbed the silver. Who should we be watching out for tomorrow and, and Sunday in the ice dancing events? Right. Well, I think there are two top U.S. ice dance teams right now, Hubble and Donahue. Chalk and Bates, um, these are two teams that have had an intense, really wonderful rivalry for a number of years. Um, so many championships between the two teams. And coming out of the team event, like you said, they have a lot of momentum. Each of those two teams won their respective components, the rhythm dance and the free dance. Um, and I think heading into this individual ice dance event, um, some great momentum for, for both of those teams. Meryl, I remember watching as a kid and asking my mom, Mom, are they married? Because <laughs> the, the chemistry is always so important and they're such fun partners to watch. And I guess Madison and Evan are even a couple off the ice. Can you talk to us about how important chemistry really is? I know it can really make or break it out there. Right, I mean, I think like, what you're seeing with these two is so special, so unique, and I think that's the key with ice dance, to have that thing that makes you stand out, that makes you special and, and different. Um, and I think that can come across in different ways. For some, it's, you know, a technical proficiency, a focus on that, and, and chemistry, artistry, unique interpretation of, of the music and what story you're trying to tell, and so, um, you know, Ice dance is just, it's come so far. It's evolved so much in the last couple of Olympic cycles. And so to see where these teams are now, to see the depth, um, you know, not just in the top two, top three, but, you know, throughout the field, is it's so fun to watch. Meryl, I want to ask about Russian figure skater uh, Kamila Valiva. She, she did test uh, positive for a doping test back in December. Um, I, I'm just curious. We don't know what hap is going to happen because there is a hearing taking place now. But if she does not compete, does this give someone else the opportunity to shine? Hmm. Well, I think it's a complicated question. And you hate to think of you know someone's struggle as, as an opportunity. And, I think perhaps that's a way to look at it, but I think as the situation continues to evolve, what I keep coming back to is I'm following the headlines and the information that's coming coming out is, you know, this is a minor, this is a 15-year-old girl, and I find it incredibly heartbreaking in so many ways. The ladies' field, the women's field, is incredibly deep. There's so much talent coming out of the Russian Olympic Committee and beyond. Of course, we have some three tremendous women coming out of the US, but it's a heartbreaking situation. And I think one will have to really wait and see and have some patience as we see how it unfolds. Hey, Meryl, do, do you, I know you have some friends who are on Team USA, the skaters there. Uh, have you been chatting with them since they got there? And, and if so, any advice you've given them? Yeah, I mean, I, I chatted with a couple of my friends on the team over the last couple of days. I was chatting with Adam Ripon this morning, kind of getting a feeling for what's going on, what the vibe is like there. Um, and I think, you know, I, I 
love chatting with athletes before they go to the games, talking about that balance of um, embracing the moment, embracing this unique, special experience. And you know, the, the hair on my arm stands up as I think about the Olympic Games and what it means as an athlete, spending your whole life preparing. Um, but then also you're trying to balance it with focusing on the task at hand and the job that you have to do, you know? And so the joy of, of you know, embracing being a member of Team USA while also knowing what you've prepared for all your life, the opportunity is before you. And so, you know, before the athletes head to the games, I love talking about that balance, but once they get there, they're on Team USA for a reason. They know what they need to do. They're so prepared, so, so, so prepared, so ready, and they don't need any advice from me. <laughs> Fair enough. But I'm sure they appreciate it. Yeah. Davis, not true. Uh, thank you, Meryl. Thanks for waking up early for us out there in L.A. And folks, thank be sure to watch Team USA figure skating in action this weekend on NBC and Peacock. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts. In the city of angels, two kindly old ladies wanted to help homeless men get off the streets forever. And so they did. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, the new podcast from Dateline and Keith Morrison. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. I believe, I believe. Every dream, journey, and triumph. And it all starts here. United States, let's go! Feel the magic every day. The excitement is in the air. At the Winter Olympics, today is where the games begin. You got that magic. You got that magic. You got that magic. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. I believe, I believe. Every dream, journey, and triumph. And it all starts here. United States, let's go! Feel the magic every day. The excitement is in the air. At the Winter Olympics, today is where the games begin. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> All right, Cincinnati may be in the spotlight uh, for this year's Super Bowl, but right now, we're going to head a little north to Cleveland and the Browns, a breakout star this season, Dernest Johnson. Yeah, Dernest turned his NFL dreams into reality thanks to the hard work and the power of persistence. We're going to talk to Dernest in a moment, but even if you don't follow <laughs> football, you are going to want to check out this incredible story. It was a Thursday night in Cleveland, Ohio. A primetime matchup between the Denver Broncos and the Browns. Running out the tunnel and you hear them call your name as a starter and it's just a dream come true. I just cherish every moment of it. Cleveland's running back, D. Ernest Johnson, is having a career-defining game. It's his first time starting, and less than three minutes in. Give it to Johnson. He's off a rub hit. He going to the goal line. Touchdown! How about that? That might be the most impressive drive of the season so far. I scored my first touchdown ever touchdown in the NFL. This moment was a long time coming for the 25-year-old. He got here with grit and determination. Raised in Florida by his aunt Andreas, a cafeteria worker who taught the future NFL pro the importance of a strong work ethic. She worked the tail off 24 Savage and trying to make ends meet, and, and that's what she did while taking care of uh, my grandma. Dearness played at the University of South Florida. While there, he also became a father at the age of 19. You know, I didn't have my father around, so I was more driven. You know, I had a purpose, a real purpose. I let him have a better life. But his game plan had some major setbacks. He left the 2018 draft without getting signed. Instead, Dearness became a fisherman, reeling in Mahi Mahi in Key West. It wasn't easy at all. Like, the biggest one I caught was like, almost the size of me and stuff. Man, like, this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. My goal was to always to make it to the NFL, and no matter how many doors was closed, like, I got to find a way just to go out there and, and make it happen. First, Ernest tried to get his foot in the door at the Alliance of American Football League. 
I DM like every single like AAF team out there. And uh, I just told him like, hi, my name is Dearness Johnson. No team didn't hit me back at all. <laughs> and I'm like, man. Persistence paid off. Not only was he signed by the Orlando Apollos, he was one of the best running backs in the league. It is crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. But when the AAF went bankrupt, the Ernest set his sights on the NFL. First try I had was with the New England Patriots. Tryout after tryout, the Ernest had no callbacks. Finally, a big break in 2019. I was on my way to yoga. That's when the Cleveland Browns called me. Dearness signed as a third string running back. I was signing a paper and I was just shaking, just signing the paper. So I'm like, wow. He came in humble, um, you know, hardworking, had the right attitude. Dearness is a guy that comes in, he earns it every day. He's always talked about, you know, the slow grind, trusting the process. He's a guy that literally lives that every day. And for his first NFL touchdown, the now father of two would carry the Browns to a 17 14 victory that night. A dream come true. You know, it's been a long journey, man. And I just, it's a great team victory. Yeah. Yeah. And you just see how excited his teammates were for him in that moment, just knowing the type of person that the Ernest is. It was definitely worth the wait. You know, just putting all that hard work and just seeing it finally pay off and stuff, I wouldn't change this journey for anything in the world. Don't forget to tune into NBC or Peacock to watch Super Bowl 56 Woo! this Sunday when the Bengals take on the Rams. Bengals! Yeah. Plus, you can watch the Olympics all day on the networks of NBC and in primetime tonight on NBC and on Peacock. Have a great weekend. Bye. Of, of snowboarding for almost 20 years. Yeah. yeah. And you're going to walk away from it. Mm -hmm. And you're okay with it. You've made peace with it. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm so good with it. Wow. And there it is. 46.8, the highest score we have seen all day. Snowboarder Sean White grabbing gold in the men's halfpipe, shredding the competition, and flying high into the history books. It's his record third medal in the event, and coincidentally, the 100th overall Winter Olympic gold for Team USA. Here you are on the verge of your fifth Olympics. Is it still as special as it was when you were making your debut in Torino? You know, I can't say it's as special, it's just got its own qualities to it, you know? Nothing compares to the first time, but, um, you know, I haven't really said this too much, so it's gonna feel weird coming out of my mouth, but this, this is, uh, I think, my last run. So it's got a whole different special meaning, I think, this one. I'm really enjoying every little piece of it. I mean, the ups and downs, the traveling, the camaraderie with uh, my team and, um, you know, the other athletes, and there's just this kind of glow to it, you know, so I'm really savoring every moment. No matter what, this is it. I think so, yeah, yeah. Why? You know, it's, so it's hard to talk about, you know, because my, my whole life, I've kind of, you know, been looked at as somewhat, you know, <laughs> superhuman, because I do these, these things, and a lot of people, I've always come up to me and just like, I don't know how he does it. And I, you know, and I prided myself on being that, you know, individual and man, realizing and, and admitting to myself and everyone else, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm human. It's, it's taking a toll, there's wear and tear. I mean, like, you know, I, I've, <laughs> I finally realized what the older competitors were talking about. They're like, wait till you're 30, wait till you're 30. I'm 35 now and I'm like, I wake up and I'm like, going to my coach, like, God, my ankle, you know, my ankle hurts. He's like, what happened? I'm like, 
nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I woke up, <laughs> just like, oh, you know, or my back. I was doing something so silly, like in the gym. I, it, no weights, nothing. I was just jumping up on this box. I, I just landed and my back just kind of went like, <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And, and I'm thinking like, ah, give it a couple hours. I'll be good. You know, three days later, it's like, oh, maybe a week, like two weeks. I'm sitting there like, oh my goodness. Like, you know, just that recovery time and that ability to bounce back is just, you know, unfortunately it's just not what it was. And um, I don't know, I've always kind of assumed that I would get a sign, you know, whether it was my body or whether it was, you know, my motivation wasn't there or, uh, or the tricks just got so heavy, I wasn't ready. I couldn't han handle it anymore. I couldn't deal. Um, but I think it's, it's, I think it's now like a little mix of it all, you know. I, I don't know. I think the motivation's definitely still there. But the body, you know, the, the, the decline in the abilities with the, the sport still rising, it's just an inevitable sort of situation to be in. And um, being honest with myself and just putting it out there, you know, I, I, I want to be... I mean, I'm a competitor. I'm gonna give it everything I have. I, I, I know what I wanna do. I wanna end it in a certain way. You know, obviously having three gold medals is just incredible for me and my career and, and the legacy I wanna leave behind. And I feel like this last Olympics especially was just the icing on the cake. I mean, that one was even a stretch. I was feeling the wear and tear and, you know, came down to that last run. I'm the last guy to go. I had to do a run I had never done before in competition in order to win it, and I just nailed it. Are we gonna see the back-to-back -back 1440s? Yes, we are. Back-to-back -back 1440s there for Sean White. The skyhook, the front side 540. Now into the double make twist, the tomahawk, and he gets that around. Sean White now with a front side double court 1260, and he puts it down, and Sean White with an incredible run there. Looking back, I mean, I'm so proud of that moment. And so now I feel like I'm in this kind of bonus situation. And um, so yeah, I'm taking it day by day. Um, but um, this, this, will be, this will be it. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of excited about it, though. You got that magic. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter, in this closet. I took shelter, right in this closet, right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcast. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts. I've been kind of describing it to friends of mine, because, and I laugh when I think about it, because I've got this huge event coming my way, you know, Fifth Olympics, so much pressure I'm putting on myself, what I want to do, you know, to have a great appearance, a great showing. Um, but then some part of me kind of like laughs and smiles. It's like when you know that high school is ending and you don't, you're like, well, I actually don't. I don't ever have to go to school again if right. I don't want to. You know, obviously, you know, there's college and whatnot, but say you're graduating college, you're like, wow, well, like, no more homework, no more, you know, showing up to class on time. You know, like, for me, it's it's a wild concept. This has been such a, a long and amazing journey in my life, but to, to be reaching this point of like, wow, I won't have to, like, worry if today's the day I'm going to get, like, a terrible crash or, like, be stressed that I'm going to, not put down the run when it has to happen or, you know, and I, I think 
it's it's a really bizarre but exciting you know feeling and um something i'm looking forward to and then i get to come up and uh watch everybody else stress out <laughs> you know like you know so it sounds it sounds good um you know but i i just don't know what it'll be like until i you know i i can see the doors cracked open but i haven't fully walked through it yet obviously so and you've been the face of of snowboarding for almost 20 years yeah, yeah. and you're going to walk away from it mm -hmm. and you're okay with it you've made peace with it yeah i i'm 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 so good with it you know you seem Which like is, you are how, yeah. did you, how did you get here i'll tell you so I think there was a couple things in this this path to feeling the way I am now, but one of them for sure was like talking to Tony Hawk. He's always been, you know, an amazing guy and, you know, somebody that's been through it all. I remember talking to him and he was like, man, I, he's like, I retired at, at 32 and he's like, I wish I would have done it sooner. He's like, look at, look at my career. He's like, I, I've done more now than my entire competitive career. He's like, I'm still Tony Hogg. I still do the stuff. I, I skate every day. I have fun. I'm just not worried about like getting points and getting scores and titles and things. It's like a different way to look at it. And I think that's what's so amazing about our sports is that there is, you know, a sort of life beyond competing. You know, there's filming video parts. There's all sorts of different things that you can do and be so productive in the sport when you're not competing. So that was like really cool to talk to him and kind of get a glimpse of what that life's like. And to hear him say he would have done it even sooner was yeah. kind of a trip to me. Cause I thought 32 was yeah. pretty young, you know? So, 35 is pretty young. Yeah, and so that's what's, that's what's awesome too, is I feel, you know, maybe not as, as, you know, I don't think it bounced back as fast as when I was 19, obviously, but I feel great. And I think, you know, um, you know, gosh, to, to feel solid about my physical <laughs> well-being and still I, continue on. I know, I, you know, it's. Um, but I really didn't think I'd feel this way. Yeah, I was gonna you say, know, I mean, you I really like, seem to be at peace with all of it. I, yeah, yeah. Good for you. Yeah, thank you. Not nervous, not worry. There's some concerns, you know. Obviously, like, you know, I've been at certain events before. I have a, I have a event series that I put on. It's called Aaron Style. And I remember handing out an award to the winner. I don't compete at my own event. And I remember handing this award to this <laughs> young snowboarder. And like this deep rooted part of me was like, I want this trophy. I, don't want to <laughs> give, I didn't want to give it to him. Um, so I know there's some sort of, you know, competitive void that will need to be filled. Yeah. Um, but but I'm excited about it. I think I think it's time and I'm, I'm definitely you know, I've kind of made peace with it all. And so now that's why everything's super fun and enjoyable. And I'm kind of like, you know, making the rounds with all the riders and, yeah. um, you know, uh, yeah. You have a farewell tour. Yeah, totally. So I'm just excited to see what he's got here on the money. One, One two, and three. Oh, he threw it out here. He is not holding back. This triple cork, once, once deemed too dangerous for competition. And now it seems like to win in, in Beijing, you may have to pull it off. Yeah, um, so the triple cork, I mean, started, <laughs> it's kind of my fault, I think. <laughs> I tried it back in 2013. It didn't end well. Does he realize he's in trouble? You see the helmet explode off his head. It was strapped on tightly. That is a block of ice that basically he took to the face. I think I, I came through the flip and I just, uh, I felt like I was too far inside the wall, like I just didn't pull off enough. And I'm thinking these thoughts, you know, after two flips, so I kind of open up and I clip the top and fall to the bottom. And, um, you know, it was a pretty epic crash. I bounced back, you know, it took me a minute, but I, I you know, got back to it. And then the sport kind of took this other turn. We'd only done double flip 1080s at this point. Yeah. And another rider had invented the double flip uh, 1440. So the, the numbers I'm throwing out are just degrees of rotation. Okay. So 180 is half of a circle, 360 full circle, 540, 720, uh, 900, 1080. So just while doing a double flip. So it's a, it's a lot of 
twisting and flipping, but he managed to pull it off. And I remember seeing it online and I, I, I don't know how I figured, I just like studied it all night and then did it the next day. <laughs> I went up and just like pulled up his video and then um, landed it. And that was before Sochi. Um, and, you know, that's kind of how far in advance that trick was, the yeah. triple cork. And so now it's kind of come back full swing. And there's, I think, three or four, you know, Japanese snowboarders that have attempted it and landed it. And so it's, it's definitely become something that, you know, we'll have to have going to Beijing. The Sunday Sit Down with Willie Geist podcast. It's the conversations you want to have with the people you'd love to meet. Get your money's worth. Unedited, unfiltered. See ya. Sit down with Willie and listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. I believe, I believe. Every dream, journey, and triumph. And it all starts here. United States, let's go! Feel the magic every day. The excitement is in the air. At the Winter Olympics, today is where the games begin. Got that magic. You got that magic. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. How, how has the training changed? Um, since your debut almost 20 years ago? How do you train yeah. differently? Um, or do you? No, it's, it's, it's totally different. I mean, I used to just go. I mean, I, it, whether it was, <laughs> you know, windy or whatever, I mean, I would just kind of like, you know, figure out where I needed to be at what point in the year, and I would just, you know, get there, little steps every day to get to that point. Um, you know, and I think as time went on, I realized that I needed more, um, I think just like companionship. I needed people around. Cause it would just be like me out in the wilderness, a couple cameramen and, and you know, my coach and we would just get to it. Not even a coach actually at that point it was just like, okay, where's half I Like I know what to do. And, um, and, and you know, most of the cameramen were like, they're all my friends, the ex snowboarders or whatever. And so, you had people around you, um, which was fun, but no other riders. It was just me and the half pipe. And as time went on, I think Sochi was that benchmark where I realized that like I'd been drawing from the same pool of motivation mm. and that had just kind of run dry. Um, and, and I couldn't get to that place I needed to anymore without you know, changing a lot of things in my life. Um, you know, which, which was really, you know, it was a difficult time. I mean, social media had just exploded and like, you know, there's a difference between like hearing about a friend's birthday you missed or a family outing or something. And it's a difference, you know, big difference between seeing it on this like this giant revolving, you know, um, window of everybody's lives and oh, it was Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> Oh, it was so, uh, oh, they're, oh, they're all in Cancun. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I'm missing everything. Oh my God, <laughs> yeah. And, and at a time where I really wanted to, you know, be in those places and enjoy those things with my friends and uh, family and people. Um, so that was just like a tough time. So there, there was like a longing to, you know, do something different after that many years of competing and doing the kind of same thing. And I remember being at the Olympics in Russia and 
I'm standing there at the half pipe. I'm the last person to go. There's one more run. And for some reason in my gut, I was just like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose. I'm gonna blow this. I don't know why. I, I just, I was sitting there, I could feel it. <laughs> yeah, Sean. Yeah, baby. One run for it all. Sean starting this run off huge. He wants it. Will this be the 1440? Oh! Pulling it off. Slight mistake. Yuri Podlachikov looking on in anticipation. Wow, this is going to be a difficult one to score. Yeah, it was like watching this movie that you couldn't really change the outcome until it was over and the fog was lifted. And I'm like, wow, what, did this really just happen? Like, what's my life like now? All these things. And, um, and so the journey to that next Olympics wasn't so much of a physical one, but like a, a mentally, mental and emotional one. You know, I had to kind of like, go, okay, like I'd never been to an Olympics and lost before. These constant reminders of it everywhere. and. Um, but there was this amazing silver lining to it all where you know, people were like, oh, you're, you're the champ. I'm like, what? Oh, we're still counting the, the times before? I thought it was all erased. So it was this kind of wonderful place to find myself. And from there, I took these you know, amazing steps to just kind of like generally be happy, you know? It was, it was tough, honestly, because I didn't really know where to start. And none of it had to do with snowboarding. I was like, okay, well, like, uh, you know, my brother and I worked together for years designing products, doing all these things. You know, he had gone through a kind of a tough time in his personal life, and I was in my 20s going crazy, and we just kind of parted ways, and we had never really addressed the issues. You know, we were still, you know, cool with one another, but we, we never really talked about it. So it's like, oh, we should go talk. and gosh, I should go to that Cinco de Mayo event. Oh, and I should go to this. And like, so I started doing all the things that, you know, I felt like I'd missed out on or I wanted to do and took a little time away. Um, and then I started piecing these things together. Like, okay, well, if I was going to go to the Olympics again, I feel like, you know, the previous coach and I had, uh, we had a great relationship but it just something didn't meet up at that last Olympics. So I found a new coach, this guy, JJ Thomas, amazing guy, um, super uh, high energy, motivated, super fun to be around, you know, just great. Not that the other one wasn't, I just needed something new. It was like a new businessman, a new publicist, like where am I living? Am I happy with my home? You know, you travel so much, you check in, you're like, gosh, is the pool even working? Like, is this I'm working so hard for all these things that I don't enjoy them? Um, so anyways, that was like, these little steps of like, well, what can I change in my life to just be overall happier? And I remember working out was a big one. And I laugh about that because <laughs> when I tell people that I started working out in 2014, <laughs> they're like, really? I thought you, well, I didn't need to before. I didn't really, yeah. you know, I'd been winning. So I was like, well. So you weren't working out? No, like... I mean, I was claiming it pretty, if you go look at the old interviews, I right. was, <laughs> right. I was claiming it pretty hard, but. Uh, it's no, all it's all <laughs> no. I mean, I would I would occasionally like hit the bike or do yeah. do some things, but I mean, I was I was competing an entire winter season as a professional snowboarder and then kicking into gear as a professional skateboarder all summer. So I I didn't really need it. I was so physically fit. Um, but when I actually applied myself and started working out, it was yeah toward the end of like 2014, and um, I just remember thinking like. Every time I leave the gym, I feel better about myself, about my day, like I accomplished something. And I was like, I just want to feel that way. And then obviously you get the benefits of working out consistently. Um, but those were just these like steps that I was taking toward this overall kind of, you know, feeling better about just my life in general. And then once I got back on the snowboard, I was just like a happier guy. And I was like, oh, I'm just getting back to what I know. And then it just took off from there. But that was all, it was all fine and, and dandy until I got to New Zealand and had this like horrific crash. So, you know, that, that whole journey I was on was like really put to the test. These days, the news never stops. 
The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter, in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet, right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it, I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. And to the favorite, the 19-year-old Sean White from Carlsbad, California. Are you as fearless when you're out there at 35 as you were at 19? I think that I'd have to say no, just because I've, I'm older and I think now. <laughs> I can actually process the like, oh, I've been through this bad accident, so if this goes wrong, I do know the outcome, <laughs> you know? And you start to like, you know, you take in things into account. Like, oh, I didn't sleep as much last night. Oh, should I really be doing this? Or, uh, you know, am I still jet lag? Am I this? You know, and you, you get good reasons to procrastinate. So it's definitely tough, but I will say I still have that ability to pull the trigger when I need to. I go, okay, today's the day. Let's go. I mean, if you go check out my uh, some posts I just put on my Instagram from Switzerland, I just I was there that day. Here's it's, the time is now, I gotta do this trick. And I just flew in the air, clipped the top, flew to the bottom, hit my back, you know. The crash is, this, it's a kind of necessary evil of, you know, progressing. You're gonna take falls, you're gonna mess up. You have to adjust and be ready. And so I will say I have the abilities to, to, to still like go for it when I need to. But I think I just needed more rest days after the crash. Yeah. More ice. Not to the crash, but just as, <laughs> as you get older, just needing more rest in general. Yeah, of course. Um, in Tokyo, as you know, Simone Biles uh, started a very um, powerful conversation about uh, mental health and athletes yeah. and the games themselves. Mm -hmm. um, as that was unfolding and you were watching and listening, what do you think? You know, that was wild. I was actually lucky enough to be in Tokyo at the time um, doing some, you know, behind the scenes TV stuff. And um, yeah, I was, I was taken back by what she did just because it's such a rarity that we kind of like come out and say how we're feeling, you know, there's, there's such a rarity to it. And I think her opening up really kind of paves the way for other people to explain how they're feeling, whether or not they need to pull out of the event or not, you know, is up to them, but just to be like, hey, I'm really feeling this pressure, you know, it's, it's always seen as like weakness as an athlete, you're supposed to be just like, you're strong, you're never wavering, you're, you know, the, the clutch performer when it's all on the line, you know, you have to be that way. And like I kind of admitted when we first started talking, you know, I'm, I'm human, it's, and it's hard to admit that sometimes. So I was, I was, I was, you know, proud of her for taking that stand. And especially the fact that you can go out there and potentially get hurt. Um, I was in a very similar situation um, at the Russia Olympics. I had made the team for the slope style event, which is a series of jumps, unlike the half pipe. Um, I'd earned my spot. I'd, I'd taken crazy, you know, crashes and all these things to get to that place, earn that spot. And I got to the Olympics and remember standing there going, this course is just like terrifying. I'm watching people crash left and right, getting knocked out. Don't even remember flying there, like all these, things and I just went this this isn't worth it and I, I pulled out of that event and I got a lot of backlash from you know fellow 
you know, competitors and people and, um, you know, just the online chatter about w w my decision, you know, and, um, and it was tough. You have to be very strong willed to deal with that. And I was just so excited to see that people embraced her rather than kind of like, you know, pushing her aside yeah. as somebody that was undeserving of being there or, or, you know, had failed us in somehow, which is complete, completely wrong. It was incredible. So what is Sean White's expectation for Beijing? I've kind of just told myself that I'm going to give it everything and I'm just going to let it happen as it will. I don't know. I'm just going to let the, the you know, kind of chips fall. I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I'd love to sit here and be like, I'm going to win it. And this is going to, and I'm going to be standing there. And maybe, maybe not. You know, I've kind of prepared myself for each outcome. And that's, I think, kind of why I'm so happy about everything is I've, I've prepared myself where I'm like, gosh, if I, could win again. I mean, oh my goodness, like what a amazing accomplishment, even to podium. It sounds like you've changed your expectations over the years. Yes and no. I mean, obviously, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm competitive, so I'm going to give it everything I have. But I guess I've been on both sides of the coin. You know, I've been to the Olympics and won. It was incredible. Obviously, it changed my life. And I've been in loss before, you know, fell short of the podium and, and life went on and it was amazing. And you know, and so now kind of going in, well, and then I went back and I won again. So I've, I've kind of realized this sort of, you know, blissfulness of it all. It's like I can, I can go there and I can, you know, have an amazing time and either succeed in, in my endeavors and, and get that gold again and get what I'm, I'm, trust me, I want it. You know, I wouldn't be here if that wasn't the case, but being able to like stand proud and pass the torch to the next generation would be amazing as well. So I'm kind of ready for it all. Facing growing crises here and overseas, President Biden sitting down with NBC's Lester Holt, a candid one-on-one -on 